um, we had such a, an enlivening and challenging session, and I'm sure we're going to revisit some of those questions and some of those challenges as we, as we go through the afternoon. Um, and this session, whereas the, the last we were talking about, about this idea of ripples of hope and the change that has to be um, undertaken, in this, in this session we focus more specifically on that challenge of prosperity and justice and, and look in a little more detail perhaps at the very specific changes in institutions and policies that have to happen to deliver that. And, and to talk about that um, first, um, I'm just looking to my speakers to, who were deciding over lunch. Miata is going to um, kick us off. Um, Miata is now uh, the chief exec at the New Economics Foundation. Before that, she was a director of policy and research at the Institute of Public Policy Research. And before that, she worked at senior levels for the leader of the opposition, the cabinet office, and the prime minister's strategy unit. And um, her work really has been at the forefront of policies from devolution to local economic growth, housing, energy, climate, and transport, and driving forward the government's economic devolution in England. So I am particularly pleased uh, that Miata is now the... Do you call yourself chief exec or director? Chief exec of the New Economics Foundation. It's an organisation that I have been intimately involved with for almost 30 years. I would say I am still an associate or fellow or something of the New Economics Foundation. And actually, the, the, the role that something like the New Economics Foundation has played in getting us to this point and its potential role in getting us to an economy that works is one that uh, cannot be underestimated, really. So it's a fantastic pleasure to welcome you, Miata, to talk to us this afternoon. Thank you, Tim, and thank you all. Um, I'm absolutely excited and delighted uh, to be here. Um, I think the thing about uh, the New Economics Foundation and the thing I found incredibly interesting kind of coming, coming into the organisation is that, you know, we were set up 30 years ago, and throughout our 30-year history, we have been arguing that the economy is broken uh, because it does not work for the majority of people and it does not work for the planet. Um, and, you know, if you want to achieve economic and environmental justice, you've got to fundamentally overhaul the economic system and the model, the neoliberal model that underpins it. And I think the thing that's really interesting for us as an organisation is that an idea, an argument that for a long time was an outlier argument is now very much in the mainstream and very much at the fore of the political debate. You know, so we thought it was incredibly interesting in the 2017 general election that pretty much every single political party went into the election saying that the economy doesn't work. And, you know, they were saying this because they were reflecting a deep sense in the country that the economy is rigged, that the system doesn't work for people, and that the social contract that has essentially dominated the fabric of our politics since the mid-40s it's fraying. You know, that promise that if you work hard, that if you do the right thing, that you'll get ahead, but more importantly, your kids will do better than you, has broken down. And I think people are understandably fed up. Uh, they're frustrated, they're angry, and they want change. You know, so whether you agree with the vote to leave the European Union, the Brexit vote, uh, or not, one thing is absolutely clear, it was a call for change. And it is a call for change that will only get louder and louder and the louder in the months and years ahead. Particularly when it becomes clear that Brexit is not the panacea that many people hoped that it would be. And I think how we respond will be the defining political issue for the next decade. Now, our view at NEF is that in responding, we must not tinker in the margins and that it is absolutely time for fundamental, bold and radical change. And I think we would argue that actually the conditions for such change is starting to take root. 
So the three drivers of the current crisis in our system, we think, are coming together in a perfect storm and will come together in a perfect storm over the next five to ten years. So the first driver is the economic breakdown. This is the sort of heart of what we're talking about today. Um, and in essence, the fallout from the financial crisis is catching up with us. And it is bringing the shortcomings of the current system into sharp focus. You know, we've had a decade of wage stagnation, a decade where wages have been flatlining, which we're told uh, by the government's watch drug is set to continue into the mid-2020s, which is absolutely remarkable. We've got ourselves into this situation where the economy is growing, or we're told the economy is growing, but actually the majority of people aren't feeling the benefits of it. Instead, they are being squeezed. They're being squeezed because the cost of essential things they rely on, transport, housing, electricity, gas, water, is going up. Many people are having to borrow just to get by, and I'm staggered by the fact that there are three million households that are severely indebted in this country, the majority, three quarters of which are in low- and middle-income households. And at the very time when people needed help, public services they relied on have been decimated in the name of austerity. And, you know, for me, there are a sort of handful of stats that I always reach for that, for me, just typifies and summarises um, the scale of the problem. Um, and the first is on inequality. So wealth inequality, um, where we have 10% of households that now own 45% of the country's wealth, which is pretty staggering. But, not, but um, at the other end of the spectrum, 50%, so that's huge numbers of people, only own 9% of this country's wealth. 30 years ago, a typical chief exec uh, would be expected to earn 120 um, times the average salary. Today, it is 120 times the average salary. And there are one in three of our children that are living in poverty, many of which are children from working families. Um, and, you know, my take on this is actually this sort of inequality is endemic in the current economic system. It is endemic in the current economic model. But I think people were willing to kind of swallow it. They were willing to go along with it as long as they were doing incrementally better from the system. And essentially, the logic of trickle-down economics uh, worked. And as this has broken down, in the way that it's broken down over the last decade, I think the pu public tolerance uh, for a system that is fundamentally unfair and fundamentally unequal is hitting a buffer. So that's the economic breakdown. I think the second driver is the political crisis, which many of us are familiar with. This widespread disaffection and lack of trust in our politicians and our political institutions that is undermining our democracy and actually spreading beyond politics. So now there's a deep distrust of the media, of business, of the charity sector, and this sense that there is this elite, this detached elite, that is either unwilling or unable to tackle the problems that people face. The final driver, uh, which you overlearn, is the environmental one. Um, and bizarrely, this is the one that, if you like, is less prominent in the political debate and which absolutely should be, because in the end, the threat to our planet, you know, the impact of environmental degradation is the biggest threat to social justice. It is the biggest threat to economic justice that we face. And what we're being told by the ecologists, which is absolutely terrifying, is that we are reaching a tipping point uh, where the depletion of our natural resources is starting to bite on people's day-to-day -day lives. And it is not just about climate change, but it's the fact that we are depleting the Earth's resources at one and a half times its capacity to regenerate it. And for me, you know, the environmental challenge is often put in the too scary or the too difficult box. But I think we're getting, coming to a period where its impact will be so real that even if we don't want to, even if we are not ready, we will be shaken out of our environmental complacency. And I think, you know, in our, our contention, our argument is that these three things, the political, the economic, the environmental, are coming together in a very profound way that will drive change, irrespective of whether any of us are ready for that change. 
And the key thing will be whether this change is a progressive change or it is a retrograde change. And our view at NEF is that if we want it to be the former, then progressives across the piece must come together to articulate an alternative to what we have and a route map for how we get there. And in the end, this sits at the heart of the work that we are doing in NEF. And you know, what we are absolutely clear about is that the four decade old model, this neoliberal model that people talk about, is absolutely exhausted. And we need new economics that works for people and new economics that works for the planet. And for us, there are six things that we think sit at the heart of this new economy. First and foremost, it must be an economy that is rooted in a healthy and thriving environment in which an urgent green transition is seen as the priority. It has to be an economy that delivers better and more equitable living standards, in which the basics for a decent quality of life, minimum income, housing, health, social care, childcare, education, are guaranteed for all and provided collectively. It is an economy built on progressive business in which companies work for the long term and in the public interest and where social and environmental responsibility is baked into their business model and where we've got stronger voice, agency and power for workers on whose backs the wealth of this country is created. Critically, and this is absolutely critically, it must give power and ownership and a stake in the economy to others, to people, through common ownership of public goods and essential infrastructure, but greater cooperative and mutual ownership of businesses, services, technology and assets. It's got to be an economy that is supported and stewarded by an active but a decentralised state. We've got to move away from the top-down model, which is rooted in communities and shaped by strong democratic participation. And then finally, one in which power and decision-making is pushed down to communities, to people who know about their lives, who know best about how to respond to the problems that they face, giving ordering people up and down the country, getting on with their lives, the powers, the tools to come together collectively to improve their living standards. And so if that's the shape of the kind of economy that we want to get to, the big question is how do we get there? And, you know, the work that we are doing at NEF is trying to focus on six of the big challenges we think we face as a country that need a response, whether we think there is huge demand for change, where there's potential appetite for quite big and radical change, and where we think there's a scope to develop ideas that can shape and catalyse the type of economy that we want to create. So, in essence, responding to the immediate problem in a way that drives long-term systemic change. So firstly, an alternative to austerity that recognizes that you know, it is just as harmful for the state and for government not to use its fiscal state sp space as it is for it to overspend. So that we can use the public balance sheet in order to drive structural change and align this with active monetary policy to drive the kind of economy that we want to see. So, you know, we've been calling for new fiscal rules that are based on this principle of a fiscal space. And we've been calling for active monetary policy. So directing a portion of quantitative easing into the real economy through a network of local banks. We think it's about an urgent green transition with an end to fossil fuel subsidies combined with active green industrial strategy, which is designed and developed from the local up. Tackling big problem of wage stagnation um, and the power and balance between capital and labour in uh, our, our labour market by giving workers greater ownership of the organisations that they're working and a stake in the rewards that are created by that organisation. So we've been calling for an employee ownership fund which would see a share of profits each year transferred in the form of equity to workers or stakeholders in um, a trust Shares that would come with voting rights so that they would have some say and direction um, in the companies and organisations that they work with. And do this over time in a way that would allow ownership of workers to grow until we reach a tipping point in the economy. On the big question of the housing crisis, 
uh, we're arguing for a basic guarantee of affordable housing supported by a massive public sector-backed house building programme. And because we know land is so critical, we're calling for a people's land bank where we pool public sector land and we combine that with land that is acquired by lo at the local level through compulsory purchase powers, new powers that would allow them to get land at use value, and then confer and hand that land over to communities in perpetuity who, so that communities can build homes that are affordable, not this year, not next year, but forevermore. And then finally responding to the looming crisis in our public service and our welfare state, which the rollout of universal credit will only amplify by reconfiguring our public service offer through a universal basic in income and basic services, education, health, social care, childcare, and then combining this with common ownership of essential infrastructure that people rely on, so their energy, their transport, their water... And then a final component to this is the digital revolution, which is happening at a pace and making sure that actually it works for people and that the dominance of the big tech giants is challenged by the creation of new alternative platforms that are more democratically based. But, you know, for us, it's not just about a new approach. It's not just about a new model or new policies but it is about how these new ideas are made and implemented. And, you know, we think that a new economics for people and the planet must be driven, it must be shaped by those that are experiencing the worst effects of the old economy. So our starting point in all of this is that you've got to be rooted in communities. You've got to start thinking about the problem through the lens of how people are experiencing it on the ground. And then you've got to work alongside them to devise and develop solutions about how you can do things in a different way so that we put new economics into practice now. And we believe that if you do this, if you deliver, develop the solutions with people across the country... And you do this in a way that taps into the energy, uh, to taps into the desire for change and the ideas that are bubbling up all across the country and use this to build a wider movement to create the momentum for change because the scale of change we're talking about is so huge that unless you've got that political momentum, we don't think that you can unleash the type of change that I think so many people in this room today are desperate to see. Thank you. Thank you, Miata, very much indeed. That's, that's wonderful. So our, our second um, speaker for this um, session is, is Michael Jacobs. Um, and for me, it's a particular pleasure to be able to welcome him here. We've known each other for some time. We worked together, even wrote together um, in the early days. And um, he is the author of, um, as far as I know, the very first book on... Um, and with the title of The Green Economy, who I, which I believe is coming up for a birthday quite soon, Michael. It's, it's next year, is it? 1989 it was originally? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So we may have to welcome you back to do something around that birthday event next year. Um, Michael is a, an economist. Um, he has actually just accepted a, a, a professorship at Sheffield University, um, but he's a visiting professor also at the School of Public Policy at the University College London. From 2004 to 2007, he was a member of the Council of Economic Advisers at the Treasury with Gordon Brown. And from 2007 to 2010, a special advisor to the Prime Minister um, with responsibilities through that time for energy, environment and climate policy. Sustainability has really been at the heart of Michael's work um, for... Uh, many, many years, and in most recent times, he's put that energy and that vision to work uh, through the IPPR um, Commission for Economic Justice, who have just published the report, Prosperity and Justice, and Michael's going to talk to us about that today. Michael. I'm actually not going to stand behind there because I'm not tall enough. Uh, so I'm going, to, um, I'm going to do the Kerry thing, which is kind of wandering around the front. Um, 
Uh, I've been asked to speak about this report, um, which, as Tim says, was published uh, a month ago, Prosperity and Justice, uh, a plan for the new economy, which is available as a book in all good bookshops. Um, it's also available online for nothing, and there is a separate executive summary, uh, I think most of the copies of which uh, were downstairs have been taken, which is also available online. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it says, um, uh, although not completely. There are 73 recommendations for economic reform in this report, and you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through them all. Um, I want to talk more, in a way, about the kind of key messages that came out of it, um, uh, and then also a little bit about the reception it's had. Um, I'm hoping that with this audience, many of you are aware of this report. Can I just check? Because this is a really important thing for think tanks. You put stuff out into the world, and you just hope that everybody has heard about them. There was a, 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 a in think tank land, a famous survey that the World Bank did of um, its reports and what readership that they'd had. World Bank produces lots and lots of reports. Um, and there was a rather depressingly large number of reports uh, when they checked the download figures on the website that had had no downloads or readers at all. Um, uh, and all think tanks who are obsessed with their kind of media coverage and so on, Miata will know this, um, need to be aware. So can I ask, did people notice when this came out in early September or since? And be honest, how many of you have heard of this report? Uh, if I said the Archbishop of Canterbury produced a report on the economy, would that make any more people's hands go up? Did you hear about the Archbishop of Canterbury? So um, it was a very good idea of us to get the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, to be involved in this, uh, the, uh, a successor to Rowan. Um, so the commission, the IPPR is a left-of-centre think tank, um, and one of the interesting stories here is the convergence of a think tank which kind of comes out of the environmental green movement, like NEF and IPPR, which comes out of the, uh, the more traditional uh, Labour-oriented left, although the Charities Commission makes sure that no think tank now is attached politically uh, at all. Um, we set up a commission on economic justice um, in, uh, two years ago, just after the referendum uh, in 2016 uh, on Brexit, um, and uh, eight years after the financial crisis. And those two things are connected. The story that Kerry Kennedy told us this morning about why people voted for Trump is one that we are familiar with here now as an explanation. It's only a partial explanation, actually, of why people voted for Brexit. The long-standing, the 40-year stagnation of wages in the US to which she referred, um, the kind of the breakdown of that American dream uh, to which we referred, is much shorter here. It's about a 10-year period. The stagnation of wages in the UK is, is, is over the last 10 years. But that story of disinformation Franchisement of looking at the elites who appear to be doing well while ordinary people's wages have stagnated and they can't get uh, their on and their children are, uh, are loaded with student debt and can't get their homes and so on is very similar and it is a partial explanation for Brexit. We set up the commission in the wake of uh, the election result and as I say, eight years after the financial crisis, um, feeling that it wasn't enough to say there was an economic problem, that the economy wasn't working. We had to show how it could be fixed. And that the real imperative politically wasn't for more uh, Jeremiads about how everything was bad, but about solutions. And we brought together a group of people to, um, uh, to sit on this commission, of which the Archbishop of Canterbury was the most prominent, but included a range of people from the business world, so the managing director of McKinsey & Company, one of the largest um, consulting companies in the world, the chief executive of, uh, of Manchester Airports, um, some people from finance, Helena Morrissey, the, uh, the um, uh, well-known uh, investor um, in the City of London, the chair of the City of London Corporation, some economists, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, John Eatwell, some people from the community sector, Sarah Bryson, who's a community organiser in the North East, and some trade unionists, including Francis O'Grady, the general secretary of the TUC. So a very wide-ranging group of people. And the point for a think tank of doing a commission like this, and we all do them uh, um, uh, every so often, um, is in order to say this is not just the view of a small and, to be perfectly honest, slightly irrelevant left-wing think tank. This is a view of a wide range of people. But the problem in doing that, is you've then got to get the wide range of people to agree. And if they agree only on a kind of lowest common denominator of bland, frankly, boring stuff that you've heard before, it's a complete waste of time and money. What's interesting about this report, I think, um, kind of in the sociology of, of it and, kind of, and, and, and uh, absolutely in the politics of it, is that it makes some very radical recommendations for what should happen in the UK economy, and it has the support of all of those people. These are people who vote in different ways. We know we, didn't, we weren't 
Um, we, we, uh, it wasn't about party politics at all, but we wanted people who, got, who, who had different voting uh, uh, histories, people on both sides of the Brexit debate. So there were pro-Brexit people in, a gr in that group, as well as anti-Brexit people. Our view of Brexit was, whatever happens, the British economy needs to be stronger. So we didn't take a view on that. We didn't want to get mired in the debate, and we were absolutely right not, not to be. But it was an interesting group of people, and they have come up with a, um, an interesting, uh, I think, set of recommendations. Let me very quickly run you through the main arguments. So the first principal argument is the economy's not working. I'm not going to go on with that. Miata's already given you some of the reasons for the claim that, that the economy isn't working. Um, uh, uh, the stagnating wages, the rising inequality, the poverty even with people in work. More than half of people in poverty after housing costs are in work, which is uh, an extraordinary phenomenon. The particular statistic that we pulled out of the report, which I think is in a way the most telling one, is um, the decoupling of, in of GNP growth, GDP growth, from income growth. Broadly speaking, it's been true that as the economy has grown, um, average wages have grown with it. Um, and those two lines, looking at it from your perspective, those two lines have more or less gone together. As you would expect, if an economy is growing, you'd expect people's incomes to have grown. And that, by the way, is one of the answers to the, um, you know, why do we focus on GDP? Because it measures incomes, actually, and most people want rising incomes. Over the last 10 years, the graph has gone GDP, income. And that decoupling of GDP growth from average income growth is a part of the reason we are in political crisis as well as economic crisis. The economy no longer delivers rising living standards for a majority of people. It does raise living standards for lots of us, but not now for a majority of people. And that is the first time in recorded history that we've had that decoupling. And that is a very significant moment. So where's that money gone? That money has gone to the top half of the income distribution. And we've now begun to understand what the statisticians are beginning to draw distributional accounts, which is if you've got a national income, don't just measure the aggregates, the averages. They just don't tell you what you need to know. Measure the distribution. And thanks to Piketty and Saez and, and Zuckman and other people who've been working on the World Inequality Report, we're beginning, just at the very first stages, statistically, to disaggregate GDP growth and see where it's gone. And we know, because we did a little bit of this work for the UK, it's gone almost entirely to the upper end of the income distribution, and it's gone in particular to the, to the owners of capital. So the other huge change that's occurred is the extent to which people who own wealth have increased not just their wealth but their income, because of the income that generates from wealth, um, uh, to a much, much greater extent than people at the bottom. So the economy's not working. Um, uh, uh, we could talk much more about that. It's not just not working in terms of incomes. It's also not working in terms of conventional economic indicators. So the UK productivity is 13% is lower than the G7 average. Our investment rate as a proportion of GDP is much lower than most of our European partners. Our trade balance is much, much worse. Our geographical inequalities are the largest. We are the most geographically uneven uh, uh, country uh, in Europe. We set out all of that. But the other thing we do... And then this is really important, and it speaks to why I'm here, I think, and why Rowan is here, is we talk about the purpose of the economy. This builds on much of what Kerry Kennedy said. The purpose of the economy is not GDP growth. It is not even just income growth, and it's absolutely not private income growth. A world in which private incomes grow, and of course they're not right now for the majority of people, private incomes grow, but our public incomes decline. The things that we buy collectively is not a world in which well-being is improving. If you have rising private incomes, but taxation is not sufficient to pay for education, for health, for social care, for transport, and all the other things that make an economy work and make lives worth living, then that should not be regarded as prosperity. If an economy does not generate justice, and we have defined six principles of justice we, um, uh, quite carefully, it is, should not be regarded uh, as successful. If it undermines the environmental foundations on which it is based, it should not be regarded as successful. And we regard the kind of moral purpose of the economy as absolutely central to our report, even though our 73 recommendations deal with details of, of economic policy. That moral vision, in a sense, lies at the heart of this, and it was a really important contribution that Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, gave to it. So, lesson, message number one, um, uh, the economy isn't working. Message number two, we need to redefine what we mean by prosperity and justice and their underpinning in environmental sustainability. Uh, message number three is, as Miata's already put it, tinkering is no longer any use whatsoever. And this is, I think, why we are living in an interesting moment, because many more economists now would accept that proposition in some form or another, and many more people politically think that. And, of course, many of them are now voting on the right, but some are now perceiving that this to be a cause on the left. We point to a really important historical um, analogy. 
two analogies. Um, in 1929, the Wall Street crash led to the Great Depression. And about 10 years after the Great Depression, although it was quite a long period, the fundamental basis of economic thinking and policy changed. Keynes, Keynes brought in a revolution in the way we understood the economy, in the objectives of economic policy, full employment, the welfare state, social security became objectives, and in the management of economic policy. And the Keynesian revolution became a post-war consensus. And what was interesting about it politically was that everybody across the political spectrum accepted that we needed to do things differently after the war. And in the end, and uh, relatively quickly, you had a complete shift what a natural scientist and now increasingly social scientists talk about a paradigm shift in the way we thought about the economy and then what was d to be done about it. And that consensus, sometimes called the post-war consensus, lasted about 30 years and then broke down within um, uh, the memory of some of you here but, uh, but not others in the 1970s when Keynesianism as an economic theory appeared to break down. We had stagflation, as it was called, simultaneous inflation and unemployment, and which was not meant to happen under the Keynesian schema. But also many of the policies broke down. We had sclerotic nationalised industries. We seemed to have trade unions that had too much leverage over the economy and so on. And there was, uh, with the elections uh, in 1979 and 1980 of Margaret Thatcher here and Ronald Reagan in the US, we had another paradigm shift, which was a shift from the post-war consensus to the free markets, were a free market economic policy based with different economic goals in which full employment was no longer the goal, uh, trying to reduce inequalities was no longer the goal. Um, but a new settlement was put in place. And again, what was interesting about that politically was that it came to be accepted across the political spectrum. So although Labour in its new Labour incarnation, a member as, uh, and I was a, a part of that government, um, did many things to change the Thatcherite free market settlement. Um, public spending, um, uh, and particularly on public services, education and health, completely changed. Huge investment in the welfare system, in tax credits, in child benefit, um, um, uh, uh, putting in place the ending of pensioner uh, poverty on the scale we'd seen it. The fundamentals of economic policy were not changed under Labour. Um, and in that sense, you could argue that the um, that the, the free market paradigm, sometimes called neoliberalism, lasted until, um, well, when? 2008? 2008 was another epochal moment. Just like 1929, like the crises of the 1970s, 2008, the financial crisis, was a moment when the capitalist system went through a complete trauma. But what has come out of it? So far, nothing. What and some of you can remember this moment in 2008-9, thinking, at last, at last, we have a chance to do something about these problems. We can uh, think about radical change. We, we more or less, we nationalised some banks, we rescued the others. I was in the government, I was in the Treasury at the time, in the number 10 at the time, thinking, this is a moment of change. And, of course, it wasn't. And one of the reasons for doing this commission was saying that we should have been using that moment of change in 2008 to rethink the way we did the economy. Um, and in a sense, the big argument of our report is we are due another paradigm shift. This is another moment, like the 1940s, like the 1980s, when the economy has proven not to work and we need a radical change. And so we call in this report for what we call fundamental reform and we say it's happened before. One of the, one of the really um, uh, uh, sad things about the last 10 years has been instead of people feeling this is a moment for radical change, a lot of people have felt this is going to be what it's like. And it's the fatalism that comes out in surveys, when you do surveys of people in the economy, the kind of fatalism, well, this is just what it's like, this is what capitalism is, this is all that we can have. What Margaret Thatcher, you will, some of you remember, called Tina, there is no alternative, is the biggest enemy of change, and we argue, no, that there is an, there is an alternative, and we set it out in this report. So, very quickly, because Tim is looking at me already saying, I think this guy needs to move, get a move on. Um, we make some more arguments. So the first one is that a strong economy and a fair economy are not in trade-off. This is really interesting because for a long time even people on the left used to kind of feel, well, if we want a strong economy conventionally measured by GDP growth and investment and productivity and trade and so on, that probably means we need to accept a degree of inequality. All the international evidence from the OECD, the IMF and others says that that's not true anymore, that, stronger, uh, that fair economies, more equal economies are stronger economies. Now, in one sense, that's a very low bar because our economies are now so unequal that making them a bit more equal um, by giving more, more money to people at the bottom, we tend to spend more, so that uh, tends to improve uh, the economy. Uh, by not having the volatility of lots of wealth holders who are putting their money into unstable assets, that gives you more stable economy. That's not a huge bar. But the, 
that is now a pretty strong result now in, in international economic analysis. And it's a really important one politically because it gets, it gets to the heart of the issue that I'm sure everybody in this room wants to say, which is fairness and equality are part of and integral to a conventionally defined strong economy. Because if we continue to allow an argument that those two things are in trade-off, we're on losing territory. But, and this is a really important point that the Commission makes, it is no longer enough if you want equality and fairness or justice, as we put it here, to redistribute and to think you can do that through redistribution after the event. This was effectively Labour's model. Labour basically, and this is not completely fair, but it's fair enough, and I was a part of that government, basically said, let the engine of capitalism, financialise capitalism, produce the growth, produce the tax revenues, and then we, we will redistribute them to generate the fairness. Not just through tax and welfare, which we did, but also through public services, which primarily benefit people who can't afford them themselves, so the majority of people. And Labour's basic model was, let the financial system in the City of London generate the profits, generate the massive bonuses. You remember what Peter Mandelson said about that. And we will redistribute the fruits. And we used to sit in the Treasury in January, looking at the bonus figures come in from the City of London, licking our lips... Uh, because we knew that that would be tax revenues from, uh, from all those people earning bonuses in the finance uh, sector. And in our forthcoming budget in March or April, we would have more to spend. That model no longer works. It didn't work then. All we managed to do with that redistributive policy was hold inequality more or less constant. We did not manage to reduce it relative to the uh, increases that we'd seen in the Thatcher uh, and Conservative government years. Today, with inequality, both income and wealth inequality, much, much worse, redistribution is not a sufficient model. We must redistribute. We absolutely must redistribute. But the way to get justice into an economy is to hardwire it, as we say in the report, into the way the economy works. So let's give, just give some examples, and the, the Commission has lots of recommendations in this field. So let's take the labour market. We have what many economists would now call a paradox at the moment, which is more or less full employment at the same time as stagnating wages. How is that possible? Well, we have a very, very simple uh, and, uh, and empirically based uh, um, argument here, which is that workers don't have enough ba bargaining power in the labour market. You simply, if in today's labour market, unless you are lucky enough to work in the public sector or in one of the few remaining large-scale manufacturing, like, like uh, the auto industry, where there is still quite high unionisation... Workers are now in, fragmented, in a fragmented labour market where many of them are now working on their own. They're not even in workforces. There are over 900,000 people now on zero-hours contracts. 900,000 people. 15% of our workforce is self-employed, some of whom are genuinely self-employed, but many more have been forced into self-employment by a labour market, by companies that have been basically uh, offloading their employment responsibilities. And in a labour market like that, workers do not have enough bargaining power, and that is why wages are stagnating and why conditions for so many are getting worse. And the, the analysis here that this is about power is central to our report, and we're very explicit about this. So we want the recommendations here, a number of things. Firstly, we think we should uh, raise the level of the minimum wage to the living wage. Um, I think. Secondly, we want workers to have more bargaining power. So we want trade unions to be strengthened. We want to give trade unions access to, uh, to, uh, uh, to workers. We suggest even in the digital economy we might trial uh, auto-enrolment into trade unions in the same way that we have auto-enrolment into pensions, where uh, you're put into uh, uh, a trade union uh, when you join an, um, uh, one of these platforms, an Uber uh, or Google platform, and you can opt out human right. Um, but let's see whether that would increase the levels of organisation and so on. Um, uh, and we argue for a whole range of other things there. Um, another field, corporate governance. Uh, Miata had, uh, gave you the figures, which we also have, about corporate pay, gone out of all proportion to performance of the economy. Why is that? Well, you could argue that it's the marginal productivity of rubbish. Um, it's because uh, 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 executives set their own pay scales. They sit on remun remuneration boards um, of other companies, and other companies' directors sit on their remuneration boards, and it's a racket, and it's a corporate governance racket. So we suggest that we put workers on those remuneration committees and we get them to look at the, work, at the wages across the sector and we put workers on boards. They do it in other countries. The shareholder-based model is a particularly Anglo-American phenomenon. Let's get rid of it. Let's have a proper stakeholder-based um, uh, model of the firm. Let's put workers um, on boards. Let's have gender balance boards, and let's not just have gender pay reporting, but ethnic pay reporting uh, as well. A whole range of things in corporate governance 
governance. Third area is wealth. Um, we have a deeply un uh, unequal now system of wealth ownership, which is partly about shares and corporate ownership, but it's also about land. So our land system is deeply biased uh, towards speculation, um, and that's why uh, it's so hard to, to, for young people now to buy, buy a house. So we have a, a range of measures, some of which are the same as NEF, some of which we nick from NEF, I suspect, um, uh, on how to uh, improve the, the land market, uh, land value taxation, uh, compulsory purchase of housing, uh, and so on. So this is building justice into the functioning of the economy, not simply redistributing after the event. I'm not going to take you through all the stuff because there's a lot in there. I would urge you to, to read it. But there's a, a whole range of recommendations on industrial strategy, on re-regulating re the financial system, on the labour market. Um, uh, I want to uh, uh, come to one other one which is really critical, which relates to our core uh, issue of uh, the nature uh, of prosperity, which is what to do about growth. Um, we um, had interesting debates uh, about growth. Um, and, uh, on, and we have an absolutely clear position on the Commission that growth per se is not the objective. Uh, growth of incomes in itself is not the objective, although uh, if you are on low income, uh, you should have, uh, 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 expect, be able to expect a rising income. It's about prosperity and it's about justice and it's about sustainability. And the problem with a lot of the debate about growth and the environmental movement has been a, uh, a, a hope. And it is no more than a hope that if only you could do something about growth, you would solve the environmental problem. Well, that isn't true. You can have an economy that is contracting in terms of GDP, but is still generating huge, unsustainable amounts of greenhouse gases, of plastics, of other uh, pollutants, because growth is only contingently related to environmental impact. So the Commission has come out with a very simple but profound proposal for how to deal with the environmental unsustainability of the capitalist uh, economic model that we have uh, 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 today, which is what it calls a Sustainable Economy Act. Um, a Sustainable Economy Act would say uh, we cannot live um, beyond the planetary boundaries. It was lovely to hear Clive Lewis this morning talk about planetary boundaries. The planetary boundaries that constrain uh, 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 the biosphere's capacity to support human life. So we need to enshrine those planetary boundaries in law. We've done this with the Climate Change Act. The Climate Change Act, passed under the last Labour government, enshrines a boundary of greenhouse gas emissions around the UK economy. Our economy is statutorily bound to produce no more than 80% less than 1990 levels by 2050 and with the carbon budgets they're produced every 15 years. We've got to strengthen those. That's got to go to net zero, um, uh, as Clive also um, uh, uh, pointed out. But the structure there in the Climate Change Act, that there is a boundary, a planetary boundary around the British economy is the right one but we've only done it for greenhouse gas emissions. So the Sustainable Economy Act proposal that the Commission uh, makes is for that to be done for all the major environmental impacts, all the major environmental impacts that the economy has, that we define the limit beyond which we will not go. That then deals with the environmental problem. Rather than hoping that some arbitrary rate of economic growth, 3, 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, will do it for you. Let's actually address the issue we care about with regard to sustainability, stop our economy breaching those planetary boundaries, and then let's see what growth rate we get um, beneath it. Um, the final thing I wanted to say was the reception of the report. Um, as I say, this report was written in a non-partisan way. Um, it's backed by lots and lots of economic uh, data and evidence drawing on uh, um, extremely good uh, economics. And the list of people who supported it or welcomed it, and support and welcome are slightly different, I would acknowledge that, but basically said when it came out um, uh, that this is an important document which should be listened to, went in rough ideological order like this. John McDonnell, Jeremy Corbyn, both of whom mentioned it in their conference speeches, which was very nice, uh, Paul Mason, um, uh, Owen Jones, Caroline Lucas, uh, Vince Cable, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, Jesse Norman MP, Tory MP, George Freeman, another Conservative MP, um, uh, the Financial Times, the Guardian, uh, the Economist, um, and the Daily Mail. <laughs> That's a pretty wide group of people to say this report has something to say. Now, why I'm not that is not meant to be intended as a boast. It's meant to be, intended to be as a statement about where we are in political and economic debate. What happened in the 1940s was everybody accepted that we needed to move on from the wrong-headed economics and the, uh, and the misapplied policy of the 1930s. 
we needed a new post-war settlement. What happened in the 1980s, gradually, it took another 10 years, was that everybody accepted that we had to have some kind of more free market economy. What that range of support or welcome for the Commission seems to us to indicate is the whole paradigm is shifting right across the political spectrum, even though not everybody has accepted. The Daily Mail did not agree with all 73 recommendations, you might be interested to know. But right across the political spectrum, people are beginning to say this economy doesn't work in the way that uh, everybody here today has said that, and we need not tinkering incremental reform, change at the edges, but we need fundamental reform. We've not yet got consensus on what that should be, but we are moving towards it. And that is why this is, I think, a really important moment and why the work that CUSP is doing, I think, is so central. Because I think we are at that point where a very, very wide range of people across the political spectrum accept that something has gone deeply wrong and we need some deep and far-reaching change. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Miata, if you'd like to come up and join us, that would be great. Um, so we'll, where do we kick off this conversation? We've got uh, uh, a little bit of time, and I want to give uh, a bit of space to the questions from the floor, but I thought I'd just start um, a little bit with a kind of a, a challenge. I mean, Michael, you were making very much the point there that this is a, uh, an agenda that appeals to a broad spectrum that has impacts and potential traction across a, a different politics. Um, but there are, are there not, clear elements of this which speak more easily to the left than they do to the right. I mean, has there been a, a right response to prosperity and justice? And, and can you see within uh, the right as it now stands where that pickup of this agenda might come from? Yes. Um, so, so, there ha so this is, I mean, I think, you know, I now no longer work for IPPR, um, and so uh, I'm no longer bound by the charitable uh, uh, law. This is clearly a report on the left of centre. You couldn't read this and not think this was a left of centre report. Um, and its conclusions, you know, just analytically clearly belong on the left, on, I, I would kind of say, the green left, in fact. Um, but does that mean that people on the, on the right of politics can't accept it? No, and I'll tell you why. So the first thing is you need to, we need to, we need kind of, you know, the political sociology of right-wing politics is the, the Conservative Party has been taken over over the last 30 years by a particular strand of free market liberalism, market liberalism, which is not the only strand of conservatism by any means. There is a really important strand of conservatism which is about the preservation of well-ordered societies, which can be quite right-wing because it can lead to hierarchy. So Burke, you know, the great, the great hero of Jesse Norman, who's a very, very thoughtful Tory MP, is hierarchical societies. But a modern conservatism, um, Robert Oakeshott, for example, would be about um, a, a, a well-ordered society that is fair, that is equal, in which people have responsibilities to one another. And there are plenty of conservatives, of which Jesse Norman, George Freeman would be examples, who would like to see that sort of society. And they are much, much less bothered about the distinction between market and state. So you could absolutely see a George Freeman saying, yes, let's have a national investment bank. Why? Not because I believe in state or public ownership in the way that people on the left might kind of say, I want a state investment because I want the state to do that, but because the private sector isn't investing enough. And if the private sector isn't investing enough, what is the responsibility of a government that wants to produce a better economy? It's to intervene. And people on, and so Germany, not a left-wing paradise by any means, has a national investment bank, has had it since the war, one of the creations of the post-war uh, German government created, of course, by the British. Um, and nobody on the right in Germany wants to get rid of the KFW. Um, and so I can absolutely imagine a conservative politician saying, I want a better economy than one that produces for the people I'm elected by. And if that requires intervening a bit more, I can live with it. The second reason, just to, 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 to two other very quick things to say. One is, we come down very hard on monopolies in this report and for open markets. And uh, as Miata also pointed out, we are now living in an era of super monopolies. The, the big digital companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, uh, Microsoft, are unbelievable monopolies of a kind that we probably never had in any sector of the economy before. The great oil 
baronies were not as monopolistic as these sectors. Um, and they are wielding immense market power, but now also political power. You may have seen the, the, the reports about how many lobbyists Google has and, uh, and other things. And we come down really hard on that um, in very similar ways to Miata was saying. We want to open data up to community ownership, um, but also to regulate. We want those companies regulated. They are utilities now in some of their functions. The, cl the cloud search functions... Um, um, uh, and so on, a kind of utility functions. They're, we can't live without them. They're provided by monopolies. We should regulate them. There should be an off-digi, as we put it, an off-digital, which is the, uh, the regulator for, for those companies. And the right love that because they don't like monopolies either. Mm -hmm. They want open markets and so on. They've been very, uh, sort of, um, very, very taken with that. The, the other thing is wealth distribution. George Freeman said, you know, how do we persuade young people to be capitalists uh, when they don't uh, have any capital and they've got no chance of owning any capital? And the wealth distribution, and people on the right, Ameri you know, there are, not all of them, there are people who are meritocrats. They don't like wealth distribution so unequal and so on. So there's actually quite a lot of crossover. So, um, and I do think that requires them to have more, a more interventionist kind of approach to economic policy. But, you know, an Edward Heath, a Michael Heseltine, a Kenneth Clark would say, I'm not ideologically committed to open, to free market, free enterprise, anti-state in the way that, that Thatcher and the right and the neoliberal right were. I mean, very interestingly, a... Uh, Theresa May stood on the steps of Downing Street in 2016 and made a direct appeal to an economy that works for everyone. We will govern for everyone, not the few. And talked about the burning injustices, and so she was willing to use the word justice. Yeah. And we spent our first year going in and out of number 10 talking to her advisors about this. They were really interested in what we were doing. They thought that there was stuff that they would be able to use. And then when the 2017 election happened and she very nearly lost power... All those advisers left with her. She was weakened, obviously, politically. And then, of course, Brexit just took over. So all those people, Tim Montgomery, John Godfrey, uh, Will Tanner, a whole bunch of people who were really interested in this agenda and had this kind of, um, uh, this, uh, kind of, uh, um, kind of interventionist conservatism for the, for the many, as they would have put it, they all left. And it's a great shame. Yeah, I did have a. I did a little bit of talking to some of those people as well after after that election because it struck me as so, such a powerful opportunity actually for change, and I had a couple of quite interesting conversations that went along the lines of, um, actually, you know, Theresa said this on the steps of Downing Street. We don't quite know what it means. It's not quite our language. Those people on the other side, you know, they understand this language and they know how to talk about that, but we're actually learning as we go along. Do you think that was entirely dis derailed by uh, what happened subsequently in terms I, of Brexit politics? Miata also knows about this because she yeah. worked under the coalition government and so kind of knows some of those Conservative politicians much better than I do. Um, I, don't, I think it, there was a paper-thin layer of Conservative MPs who supported that agenda, Theresa Mays. It was very much a kind of her and her advisers, and I think there are a few, Greg Clark, who Miata worked with, um, and George Freeman, who became chair of his, her policy board, but I don't think it had a strong weight of opinion. The neoliberal market liberalism um, turn has taken over most of the Conservative Party, there's no question, although it's now, of course, been attacked again by, by a, a, a weirdly anti-European kind, of, um, kind of patriotism, I mean, not in my terms, but in their terms, which is now uh, which has now become more powerful than the market liberalism. Uh, in fact, so it's it's you know, conservative parties many things, but I don't think she had sufficient support Absolutely. to enable her to implement that, and then Brexit just took over. Yeah, I mean, so I was really encouraged um, by her framing and her narrative because I think it kind of opened up the space to do some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, I don't think it went very deep, I, but the reason why I'm quite encouraged about the ability to kind of get cross-party consensus, and in, in truth, if we want to drive the sort of radical change that we're talking about, it has got, there's got to be a common sense, common ground that cuts across all political parties, because you need it to stick beyond one parliament or two parliaments or three parliaments if it's going to work. And I think that the two sort of, if you like, lights of hope for me is one, they recognise the scale of the problem. Um, it is there, it's in their face, and their electorates are telling them that they've got to respond. And that, for me, is the key thing. And at the moment, they don't have a respond. And they kind of flit between, um, you know, at one point, muscular conserv um, capitalism, the other retreating back to the free market. So they have to pin down some sort of response. And they're desperately going around for ideas. You know, they're talking to think tanks saying, we need, we know we need an alternative. We said there's a problem. We're not clear what it is. We need ideas. And for me, that's a huge opportunity. I think the sort of second thing that gives me a bit of hope is, 
in, you know, when we talk about the new eco um, economics, that piece around democratizing the economy, that piece around shifting power and giving people out there the agency to shift and change the economy, I think actually appeals to a lot of conservatives. So their decentralization agenda that Cameron started was all rooted in that. And I think if you can start talking that language, you know, in the end, the free market economy is the most democratic form of economic organization. It doesn't work, um, I would contend. But in the end, those that argue it say, well, actually, this is the most, you know, equal um, an empowering way in which to organise the economy because it is down to the individuals. Now, we can test the fact that actually an at atomised individualistic response to the economy is the right one. We believe in cooperative and uh, collaborative responses and economic organisation. But I think that, that piece, I think, is potentially an opening. So if you can start with the problem and you can go into it talking about reorganising and shifting power to people, you know, the state is just a form of us organising ourselves collectively, I think that appeals and that creates the window. But, you know, in the end, whether the politics is ready or not, I think the pressure from out there in the world and people's anger and frustration will be the thing that will catalyse and force a change. And if they don't come up with a response, they will be absolutely punished at the ballot box. Whichever government comes in. Um, I, I just wanted to revisit one of the questions that was talked about this morning, which is this idea that any such change, and you both made very passionate arguments for change that is not just about tinkering at the margins, but that any such change would have to involve some kind of resettlement, and it would have to involve some kind of revisiting of how assets are shared. And the numbers on that are really, really stark. I mean, I, I was surprised behind the number that you cited to find that the, um, the, the share of financial wealth in particular is even more unequally distributed than the share of overall wealth, which is even more unequally distributed than incomes per se. So, to the extent that you have actually 60% of assets owned by the, the richest 10% of households, so a, a, a small proportion of the households owning and organising and having a say around the allocation of those assets. Is what you have talked about in, in these measures that you've both brought to the table, is there sufficient there to create that, that resettlement, if you like, of, of the wealth of the population? Yeah, so, if, I mean, for, for me, I think there are two bits. So uh, wealth inequality is a growing problem. Um, and I think the responses is twofold. I think you can tax it, and that's, if you like, the easy response, the thing that we can do. Um, but in the end, I think you have got to transfer and redistribute the ownership um, of some of the ass um, assets. And so, you know, for me, there's a really interesting piece around land um, and housing and real estate, uh, which is, you know, a means by which a lot of people are accumulating wealth. And actually, how can we think about a new settlement that transfers it from individuals that make a huge return from it back into collective ownership. Now, to do that, you've got to win an argument with the public. Um, but I think, you know, if you take the example of housing, in a world where actually, you know, within the next 10, 15, 20 years, you'll have more people that are locked out of the housing market than you have people who own homes. And actually, the ideas of sort of, you know, land that is owned collectively by a community suddenly doesn't feel so radical, suddenly doesn't feel so uh, disempowering and troubling for people. And I think that's the space in which you can talk about the kinds of structural change. And for me, ownership is about structural change, as well as the easier lever of just tax and redistribute. Yeah, I mean, I think there's very clear evidence, really, that you can't bend that inequality curve downwards just through taxation and Michael you made that point as well that it was about structural transition are these structural transitions strong enough to create that change and will they at some point come up against a, a political sensitivity to that what is ultimately redistribution of, of assets that makes that uh, transition difficult well it'll definitely be difficult you no, absolutely have no doubts about that um, and it'll also be long term um, so um, any democratic government is going to have to shift, it, um, uh, shift the ownership of assets, land, um, financial assets, over time. So the proposal that John McDonnell has now uh, announced, which came from uh, NEF, which is to have, as Miata described it, um, uh, uh, a portion of large companies' shares owned by a worker trust, 
Um, the proposal that, that uh, Neff made, which John McDonnell has, has pretty much accepted, was 10% of shares. Uh, this is effectively a dilution uh, of the existing shareholders. 10% of shares over 10 years. Uh, now, that's quite a slow uh, rate, but that seems to me to be a democratically plausible rate. Um, similarly, with land ownership, we're going to, it's going to take quite a long time to, uh, to shift land ownership in a fundamental way. And in a democratic society, that is, that is the, the limitation, but I would hate to th- to the, the consequences of trying to do it in any other way, I think, would be, would be disastrous. So um, these are long-term shifts, um, and, uh, which is another reason why both Miata and I have emphasised kind of the consensus, uh, the need for consensus. This has to, um, this has to survive individual governments. And, it, and things that survive in, in, uh, individual governments are the things that have public support, where politicians, they're the third rail. The reason that, that Medicare in the US has lasted so long was what, what American politicians call the third rail of American uh, politics. The third rail being the, the railway line in the middle of an electric railway, which carries the electric current, for those of you. Who, um, and, and so that's the one that you mustn't touch because you get electrocuted. And politician, for long, American politicians say Medicare is that. It has such support. And it's the building of, of support such that politicians, even who don't like it, say, we're not going there. Which is, which is why Margaret Thatcher getting, being toppled by the poll tax was a kind of good example. She did something which hit the third rail of British politics, and the British public said, we do not think it is fair to have a flat rate tax. And we've got to build support like that. Um, uh, and that's a political project, which is and not just a kind of economic policy project. And that's why building consensus and building public support for this is important. And why building kind of public, uh, I mean, literally ownership of it, um, uh, public stakes in this, because what you don't want to do as a politician is to take something away from uh, uh, what people have. Mm. And so that's a really important part of the project. And I mean, I think the thing that I find interesting is actually I think the, the level of public support for some of these ideas has shifted hugely in the last 10 years. I think is much greater than many of us thought it would be. So, you know, employee ownership polls really well. People think it's common sense. Well, of course, workers should have a stake, a small stake. That doesn't make that makes complete sense to me. Um, you know, and I think more of these ideas just because of the context in which we're operating 15 years ago, unthinkable. Now, because of the context, I think the public are like, it's just, you know, this seems common sense given so where we, we are, and that's the big opportunity. We did, a, we did an opinion poll on the day we launched the report, which is uh, also uh, available online. Um, we asked people, um, do you think the economy is fair? The vast majority saying no. Has it become fairer or less fair? It's become less fair. Um, is it fair to young people? Absolutely not. Is it fair to people on low incomes? Huge majorities for those things. And then we asked them about our major policies, and we, we kind of gave all the radical ones because we thought they were the most interesting ones. Majority support for all of them. And for things like regulating the digital companies, 80% support for that. Um, uh, for a national investment bank, 70% and so on. So there is an appetite out there. And, you know, a poll, a poll is only a poll. People w- will not have fully understood everything, I'm sure. Although the pollsters, you know, proper pollsters, they ask very fair questions. The appetite out there for more radical change, I think, would surprise many people. I've certainly seen that appetite. I've seen it here in this room. I've seen it in my students. I've seen it in uh, the European Parliament, interestingly, um, a couple of weeks or so ago, uh, with the European Parliament had its first conference on the subject of post-growth. Now, so, so I can't really leave this discussion here without at least um, addressing that a little bit. It is the 50th anniversary of um, Robert Kennedy's speech about the GDP. It's also the 50th anniversary of the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome led to the first report, was the report on the limits to growth, to what extent is that debate about the limits to growth still pertinent to politics today and to the kind of policies that you want to talk about? To what extent is it a challenge to those policies and to what extent is it potentially a way of reaching them? Now, Michael, you gave a, a, a very uh, clear indication that um, a policy to turn down growth, particularly at this point in time, is not necessarily a, a very constructive thing to do um, and that the way to talk about it actually is to think in terms of limits and to say this is what our we do not cross this line. But when it comes to, and let's suppose that we were in a situation where it came to a politician having to make a decision between a line that you did not want to cross and the output and the expectations of the output for the economy, how is that conversation going to go? Is it not still important, I guess I'm asking, to pick up that 50 years of discussion around the limits to economic growth and the challenge of measuring what matters, as Clive said this morning, um, is it not time actually to to make that a part of this radical change that you want to talk about? Yata. 
So I think absolutely. And, I, you know, for me, the, the, the biggest contribution I think it made to the debate was deconstructing the idea that GDP growth is the most important thing um, and putting in place the fact that actually there are other things. And you know, actually, when you talk to people out there, um, you know, so I think someone this morning gave a great anecdote about, um, you know, someone when they were talking about GDP, someone in the audience said, well, well who is GDP? Like, most people don't know, they don't recognise it. But what they do recognise are the things that are important for their well-being. Um, so I think that is absolutely critical. Um, I think in the end, um, you know, because within NEF, we have struggled with this question of growth, degrowth, um, and gone round and round in circles. I mean, in some respects, I think it's kind of not irrelevant, but it's less pertinent because our economy will be growing at a much slower rate, and there are trends that are going to be driving that for the next kind of 10 years. Um, so in some respects, I think the challenge are still the challenges. Whether you've got 0%, 1%, minus 1% growth, I think doesn't take away the fact that we need to drive change that will improve living standards and change that will fundamentally ensure that we live within the confines of our environment. Um, and in the end, I think we have to move beyond the conversation about growth, having said that it's not the most important thing, to answer the question of how and why. Absolutely. Michael? I, well, I would agree with that. I... I um, uh, I think we need a better understanding of well-being and prosperity, not just individual well-being, but social well-being, and um, which is not about happiness at all. Happiness is a kind of minor subset of that. Social well-being, which is um, our societies doing well, um, is a much bigger thing than personal happiness. And, and I think some of the well-being literature which kind of went into happiness was, was the wrong one. And I think we need a much better understanding of that. Most people actually already have that. Um, uh, and it is, it's only economists and politicians who kind of who get drawn back into, actually, this is just about GDP growth. The vast majority of people, uh, in their own lives, people refuse jobs that pay more because they want, better, they want to do better things, they want to have a better work-life balance, they want better job satisfaction, they want nicer colleagues. We all, all of the time acknowledge in our own lives that well-being, uh, human flourishing is not about uh, more income. And that needs to be the way politicians talk and think. And it was you know, great, again, to Clive this morning, talking in that way. That's about the narrative we have. And I think that is resonant with most people. And the interesting thing about Brexit is that Brexit, the Brexit debate amongst the Leavers has been exactly that. Leavers were told, this is going to make you poorer. And they said, there's something more important than that. Now, that's actually a recognition that people do not think that income growth is the only thing that matters. So let's have politicians beginning to talk more about that. Secondly, then, we do need better indicators, but we've got better indicators. The OECD, the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, already produce well-being indicators. We have them there. They're not used, and they're not... Um, uh, uh, and so we do have better indicators already. The indicators thing, again, is, can, can be a bit of a sideline, um, and, and we can produce these indicators. What matters is the policies that generate the better performance of those indicators. And what we haven't yet got is a, although I think we are, you know, we've done quite a lot of work towards it, is a coherent set of policies whose outcomes would be a fairer society, one with stronger well-being, um, living within environmental limits. And then what rate of GDP growth emerged out of that economy is not completely irrelevant because GDP growth is a measure of income. It's irrelevant if that income isn't going to the bottom half of the population. But it's just a second-order question. And that's the way I would conceive this. I think we need to focus on the things that really matter. And then the question of whether this results in GDP growth or not is a second-order question. And what, what would you put in place to focus the political mind on that as an aim? There was an interesting example recently of a couple of senators in the US who've um, put forward uh, to Senate um, a Measuring Real Income Growth Act of 2018, which, which would enforce the Bureau of Economic Analysis, for example, to report exactly that question, how economic growth would be distributed. Is that the kind of mechanism that would allow politicians to think more clearly about this question? Yes, no, we already have, ONS already does that. So if our politicians wanted to focus on wider measures of well-being, they could use either the tenfold framework that the ONS produces or the 43-fold framework. There are t there's a group of 10 economic well-being indicators and there's a group of 43. Those already exist. So that isn't the problem. The problem is we don't have the indicators. You could improve them. I would have some 
other ones, I would have distribution national, national accounts. It's whether politicians are willing to talk about them and willing to say um, uh, the GDP growth is a bit less than many economists might have wanted, but look what we've got for it. We've got higher well-being measured in, in subjective ways. We've got public services finally on the mend. We've got a reduction in levels of inequality. We've got young people now not facing the debts that they want. We think that's actually a better, that's a better outcome. And the public would be with you. The public, would the public side with the economists in those circumstances? No. So that's much more about the political discourse. I mean, we need the indicators, but indicators don't solve the problem. And what will get us to that point, Miata? I mean, is it, are we talking, for example, about a... Uh, a remit for budget and the budget reporting each year to be reporting not just growth, not just employment, but other indicators as well? Does it go beyond that? Um, I, so I think that helps, but I do think it goes beyond that. So, you know, I always find it quite interesting um, at every kind of um, budget intervention um, because a whole set of stats are uh, reeled out. And actually, they mean absolutely... The people out there don't feel that. So when you're told... Uh, we're seeing growth. When you're told that income inequality is reducing and it has no resonance with the mass of people out there, then it kind of breaks down. So throw out all the stats you want, have all the indicators you want. It doesn't matter if people don't feel it in their lives. So for me, the thing that matters is what's going out there in the real economy. The thing that matters is what people are feeling. And in the end, I think the politics will be the most important thing because when people start demanding and get angry by the fact that they are not doing better and their kids aren't doing better, I think that will be the the thing that drives the, pol the political response and all the you know we have the indicators we have the measures we can report against that but actually it's what's happening out there that I think will be the most important and catalytic things in terms of changing the debate okay let's see what's happening out there um so take some questions <laughs> from people who haven't asked before okay post work world challenges um David I think it was Now, Michael mentioned several uh, Conservative MPs who were not um, alienated by the language that you're using to frame and develop this debate. And that's a good thing, because I think it would have been much more convincing to people like me to have other people, in addition to your guests, on here coming from other political persuasions. Because the nervousness I have about the way you're going and framing this discussion is that you risk being uh, seen as being captured by the left. Now, that may or may not be how you want to play it, but the way it would come across is you're opening yourselves to unnecessary attacks. So if you had a couple more representatives on your panel from the Jesse Norman and the other uh, people who are not, do not share that centre-left green view, I think you'd have a lot more... Uh, you'd have a lot more support. Thank you, David. That's a challenge to me as much as anything else. It is a, an aim of our group to appeal across the political spectrum, and that is precisely why um, I asked uh, both our speakers that question uh, this morning. The um, suggestion to have Jesse Norman as a future speaker is a, is a very good one, and we have very much in the past had speakers from across the spectrum. But I will ask the speakers here to reflect on that challenge a little bit uh, uh, after that as well. Uh, it's a good challenge. Sarah. Uh, hi, uh, Sarah Apple. I'm a, now an independent consultant. Thank you both of you for very inspiring speeches. Um, I particularly liked Michael's uh, embedding environmental limits within the law in the same way you've done with the Climate Change Act. Um, and I would like that to include biodiversity, global biodiversity, actually, because that's something which is completely missing and is vit vitally me needed at the moment. We're losing species at a rate of knots. My question really to both speakers is, what are the chances? Um, I mean, call me a jaded ex-senior civil servant, um, <laughs> but honestly, it's very interesting to hear how your, uh, Michael's kind of expression of embedding environmental limits... Uh, developing solutions for that, changing the energy economy, removing subsidies, all of which I massively applaud. Uh, increasing energy efficiency, no doubt, would be part of that. And yet, on the same podium, Mayata actually mentions the squeeze in people's pockets, including rising energy prices. So, you know, just in that little microcosm, you can see how mischief-making in the press, which wouldn't take long, could completely destroy the, the goals of what you're trying to achieve. And somebody on one side of the same argument would say, actually, socially, this is not working for us. There's too much of pressure on people's pockets. Energy prices are going up. Food prices are going up. They need to. 
If you're going to pay for the cost of the economy, prices are going to have to go up inevitably. Thanks, Sarah. That's a, a huge challenge. Let's start with post-growth work, post-work economy. Yeah, so I mean, um, I think that's a fair challenge, and this is something we grapple with all the time. Are we being radical enough? Um, I think I've got sort of two answers to that. There is absolutely a response that we need um, to automation and AR that's going to fundamentally change the way that our economy works. Um, and thinking about how we reconfigure the labour market is part of that. Thinking about time um, and how we um, value time. So, you know, we've always called for a kind of four-day working week um, as a potential solution to um, a very different type of labour market. Um, but for me, and this is something that we talked about a lot, um, is the urgent versus the medium and long term. Um, and uh, our framing has been, partly because of the moment that Michael has talked about, that I've talked about, but also the urgency out there and some of the big challenges that people face, that actually it's beholden on us to be thinking about the solutions that can bite in the next 5, 10, 15 and 20 years. And the thing that we are start, trying to hold ourselves to is in thinking about the solutions, they aren't short-term solutions, but they fundamentally drive structural change. So we think that, you know, we focus on wages um, and wage stagnation because we think it's an immediate problem that people understand they grapple with. Um, and they're frustrated by. And we think in that frustration, we have the license and the permission to perhaps come up with ideas that are far more radical than if we weren't grappling with that issue. Um, and I so say I think there's something in the short-term crisis that creates the license and opportunity for the kind of longer-term change. Can I? Shall I respond to the other ones? Or can, I, can I come back on that one? Just so that yeah. we have... The, so um, I think we need to be very careful about um, AI and automation and kind of having an apocalyptic view of it. We've had automation for 200 years. Um, and uh, we've got more jobs in the economy than ever. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is that what automation does, um, and it has always done, is to raise productivity, which raises uh, uh, incomes, um, and then those incomes are spent on new things which we find to do. And almost always the jobs that are got rid of are rubbish jobs, and it's a good thing. And I do not um, uh, uh, historically mind that coal miners' jobs have disappeared. Coal, mine, coal mining, apart from producing uh, global warming, killed people. And it's a good thing that coal mining jobs have disappeared. What was a bad thing was the way it was done. It was done uh, in a way which, uh, which penalised whole communities, uh, in which there were no alternatives, and so on and so forth. Um, but it is, uh, 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 it is, I think, it is historically wrong to think that automation creates mass unemployment. That is not it's uh, his, the historical phenomenon. And it's also way too limited to think that what AI is going to do is to, um, uh, is to, uh, uh, is to uh, create mass unemployment. What is likely to happen, and we did a lot of research on this, is that uh, inequality will rise because the people who will do well out of AI is already happening, will be people who can co-work with it, where a the AI and the robots and other things do all the uh, menial things and all the uh, routinized things, which are the things that uh, people don't like doing, and you're left with the creative, the skilled, the managerial, the, the planning, all the things that human beings do. And that will primarily benefit the people who have those skills to do those things. And in the meantime, you, will get, um, you are likely to get um, a, 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 a suppression of wages uh, at the bottom of the labour market. So the risk of inequality is very significant. The risk of mass unemployment seems to us to be much less significant. So we need to deal with the inequality, and that's, again, about bargaining power, and it's about, uh, and it's about the control of those sectors. So at the moment, Amazon is a kind of poster child for exactly how you do not want to run an economy. Uh, Amazon, a company based on AI... Um, that is the, the, the source of its, uh, of its, uh, of its wealth, um, in which its primary owner has become the richest man in the world. Um, meantime, its workers at its warehouses, who could be the richest workers in the world, have their toilet breaks monitored. Um, that is about the inequality in the structure of that company, in the way the labour market works in workers in its warehouses. They are so fragmented and, and ununionized and so on. They, will, they won't have uh, unionization, even though he's now said he'll raise the minimum wage. And it's, a way about, and the, way about, uh, it's the way corporate shares are owned. So we need to structurally change the way companies like that are organized. But if we can do that and we can share that, the productivity gains, the income gains, from, um, then we should be able to redistribute the work and the income better. And I don't believe in a post-work economy. I'm not sure what people would do in a post-work economy. Most of us want to work. We want to have 
um, uh, purpose in life, and work is one of the ways of getting purpose in life. I do think we could have more leisure, and rather like Miata, we come down in favour of a four-day week, ultimately, as the goal here. The five-day week is a historical construct. Um, we want to see the way to do that is you start by increasing the number of bank holidays. Um, we have very four-day weeks, you know, all those weeks where we have Monday off. <laughs> Let's have a few more of those, and then gradually, if you do enough of that, you'll get a four-day week. That's a gradual thing over time, but it's not a post-work economy. It's an economy in which people, we share the work out, and we don't have mass unemployment on for one group of people and overstressed but highly creative work for another group of people. So slightly different vision, I suspect, uh, uh, I suspect from yours, but a really challenging agenda. But it's, a, it's an agenda about the control of corporations and the labour market, um, and that's how you control the technologies. Uh, before we come on to the other, can I just challenge you a little bit on that? Because, um, I mean, I, I absolutely take the points that you're making. I guess the one point where it becomes tricky is around productivity and productivity growth. Because, and as you alluded to this, actually, the productivity growth in the UK um, has been declining, in fact, since the mid-1960s, and is now close to zero. And, and one of the problems with that is that the conventional economic consensus is that wage growth should follow uh, productivity growth. So we're actually now even, w and that has not been reversed by, by automation or by robots or by all of these productivity enhancing things. So they may enhance the marginal productivity of the next activity, but they haven't actually changed the average productivity. And that is part of the problem of the stagnation of wages over the last few decades. It, does that then require that this consensus that productivity growth should somehow dictate wage growth, that wage growth should follow productivity growth, That's, that goes beyond your saying that we take the gains of productivity growth and distribute them differently. It actually says there has to be a fundamentally different settlement in relation to the value of labour. Which is exactly what we argue. So we make that very, very specific point that, uh, if we, that we should not rely on productivity growth to raise wages. On the contrary, we should raise wages and that will help put up productivity. So our argument is that we should raise the minimum wage. We should get um, trade unions to uh, do collective bargaining on wages in, in, at the lower end of the income spectrum. And that will help push up productivity growth as companies, in order to be able to pay those wages, um, are required to, uh, to improve their productivity. And what we talk about is managed automation. So we want to see automation. We want to see rubbish jobs got rid of and getting the, the income gains from those. But we want to see that fairly distributed, both the income gains and the, and the time gains that you get from those things. But no, this isn't about getting the productivity and then paying the wages. It's about both together. Yeah. And does that make it a uh, left agenda, a right agenda, a uh so I mean, uh, so I mean, I should say, Neff, we're a charity, uh, so we are not aligned uh, to any kind of political side of the spectrum. And what we have always, you know, so the thing I find really interesting about Neff as a think tank, it has always been above politics. Um, there is an agenda it has prosecuted for 30 years, which is now in the mainstream. Um, it is now common sense across the political spectrum that the economy doesn't work. Um, and so I would contest, um, and I can't speak for Cuss, but I would contest the idea that the framing of this is centre-left. Um, I think the fact that across the Conservative, across, you know, from UKIP through to the Greens, the contention that our economy doesn't work, I think, is something that resonates because actually it's what resonates as common sense politics out there in the world. Um, the ideas uh, perhaps are, you know, more appealing uh, to the left. I'll give you that. Um, but for me, I think, uh, you know, I, the minimum wage is now a cross-party idea. It came from the left. So my, my argument is that some of the things that we're t talking about that maybe feel that they will alienate people very, very soon because of the politics of where we are, because of the urgency of response, will become the mainstream, will become common sense and won't necessarily be aligned to either side. So I, I'm, I'm not, you know, certainly from a NEF perspective, uh, we are not uh, centre-left. For NEF, it is an agenda that we believe is the right agenda, um, and it is not um, with a kind of political inclination. We would certainly want to look for political space wherever we could find it, and one of the reasons for that is the sort of challenge that, that Sarah raised. Do you want to speak a little bit to that, that sort of intractability at the micro level of the kinds of policies that we would need to implement? So just uh, uh, on Sarah, um, as one fellow jaded ex-civil servant to another, um, Sarah and I worked together. She was at DEFRA doing very important work on energy efficiency. And the arguments we were having then um, uh, were the same arguments we will have over a Sustainable Economy Act, which absolutely would include biodiversity targets. That's one of the reasons we need to go beyond um, uh, uh, where we are now, um, which is that in 
constraining the economy to live with environmental limits, we have to make sure that the poor don't pay the price. And that is the same um, in, across every area of economic policy. As we've discovered with the response to the financial crisis, the easiest way of doing things is to make the poor pay the price. And that is why our tax and welfare system has taken almost all of the burden of austerity onto the people on lowest incomes and is continuing to do so. And the responsibility of, uh, of a of a good government is to make sure that doesn't happen. So in the same way that uh, we've been arguing for, you know, you and I were talking in, uh, in, in those days about how we've reduced fuel poverty and how we make sure that, that the uh, uh, that homes of poorer people and social housing and so on are insulated first and that's where we put the priority as we get moved towards a, a renewable energy system which will in the, uh, raise prices in the short term. That is going to be true uh, again of food prices. So food prices will rise. I have absolutely no doubt about that and they're, and they're going to rise anyway because of climate change and that, that policy and we have to make sure that people on the lowest incomes their incomes are raised that they can pay pay for those things the fact that we have multiple objectives just means that the world is more complicated and it is our politicians responsibility to find ways of arguing uh, about that which convince people that those are things we must do simultaneously and we cannot if we are to improve uh, our chances have a world in which uh, our environmental obligations are seen to be against our obligations to those on lower incomes that's a that would be a disaster that's the, it's difficult. There's no question about that. None of this is easy, but we have to do that. May I answer very quickly on that? I completely agree with that. And I, what I'd say is that I think at some point we won't have a choice. Um, at some point, uh, I think the scale of the environmental crisis will come at us. I think what's terrifying is that it will come at us and then we will be in crisis mode and we will be responding in huge numbers of ways that aren't necessarily thought through. But actually, I think the period where it is a luxury to ignore the environment, which I think has been the case with government policy, um, for successive governments, I think is ending. Um, and my hope is we engage with what we need to do before we are in crisis mode. Because um, we're going to have to respond one way or the other. It's not, it's not like a thing that's not going to happen. It's going to happen to us. And the key is that we do it in a way that protects the poor. Uh, we do it in a way that creates a better economy. And there's a huge opportunity to this. In greening our in uh, economy, there is a huge opportunity. And I think as soon as we can start framing the environmental agenda, not as an environmental agenda that is out with the social and economic justice agenda, but absolutely critical. You know, if, if some of the things that the ecologists are telling us is going to happen, forget about social justice, forget about economic justice. It is absolutely integral to living standards. I think until it starts being framed in those terms, where people think, actually, for me and my kids, this really matters, um, we can be complacent. But I don't think that complacency can last for very long. Let's take a, another round of questions. I have a uh, Thank you for giving me a name. I'm a modern conservative. Um, what concerns me um, in both your um, talks and answers is that um, people like um, Hall and Clittergaard in Energy and the Wealth of Nations and Ray Worth in Donut Economics are saying that the nature of our prosperity is based fundamentally on um, rising net energy availability um, from uh, going to coal to oil, um, or wood to coal to oil, um, but now we're facing um, lower net energy, and that is going to be um, make a huge difference to the amount of spare cash or spare energy that we've got to uh, use on education, health services, build uh, building, and that sort of so thing. So a fundamental challenge from res resource issues. Uh, yes, here. Thank you. Um, so there's a topic that's been raised a couple of times over the course of, the of today. Uh, Miata, you referenced it in your words, and that's the, the, the low and increasingly low level of trust that we have in our politicians and public leaders and institutions, um, which may well create apathy and disconnect rather than anger and connection. Um, either way, it's not a terribly good route to take. Um, and one would argue that ha having trust is necessary for the for the public policy levers and actions that arise to be engaged with by the wider citizenry. Um, so I guess my question is to what extent does our ability to respond effectively to the challenges of climate change, creating a new economy, tech revolution, etc., depend on rebuilding trust in public leaders, politicians and institutions? Um, and are we doing enough, if indeed anything, about that? Thank you. Resources, trust and... Um, Alison Kidd, research psychologist. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with defining jobs as rubbish jobs. I 
I'd be interested in what your definition of a rubbish job is. I find myself more comfortable with bullshit jobs than rubbish <laughs> jobs. Um, I'm doing some work in Aberfan, an ex-mining community who lost, as we all know, an entire generation through the mining. And yet when they talk about the mining, there were many aspects of coal mining that were far from rubbish. So I think it'd be interesting to know which right. jobs you think it would be good for social well-being to get rid of. That's a good challenge. Thank you. Michael, do you want to take that one first? Uh, yes, so that was a... Uh, uh, r rubbish jobs is not a term of art. It was, um, uh, it was a, um, something I'd said off the cuff. So it wasn't, I wasn't uh, claiming that there is a group of things that are, that are rubbish jobs. Um, I think a lot of work in, uh, in factories uh, are soul, is soul-destroying. I think a lot of call centre work is soul-destroying. Um, uh, I think a lot of... Um, uh, uh, and I think work that kills you um, is not good, despite the fact that you can get dignity in it. And that is the paradox of coal mining communities, wasn't it? Um, which is work that, that, because of its collective nature, and the miners work together, because of the way it was the centrepiece of the community, because of the way it gave men identity, um, for all of those reasons, and no doubt, some, and also because there was some skill in it as well, um, they were, in some respects, good jobs. But they also kill people, and uh, I'm not particularly comfortable uh, in calling a job that uh, kills you as a good job. So rubbish jobs was not a meant to be any kind of term of art. I think all of us um, uh, uh, are aware of the, 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 the different nature of different jobs. Uh, Bullshit Jobs is a very interesting book by David Graeber, which has come out uh, about that, which is more about kind of work for its, almost for its own sake, and so on. A lot of those are rubbish jobs in, in the kind of as well. So, um, but what feel, what, what's important about this, and it speaks to the kind of moral purpose of the economy, is good work, fulfilling work, work that enables you to develop work that gives you a sense of purpose, whatever that purpose is. It can be high purpose or it can be very narrowly based purpose. Work that gives you comradeship with, with other people. Work that gives you a voice so you have a chance of, dis of, of determining uh, how it's organised. Work that gives you a sense of progression, because that's a very important thing for most people, a sense that they move on in their jobs. All of those things are important to most of us. And we would like to see the commission it, it, more jobs like that. And we have a, a whole focus on good work, on the concept of good work and on valuing good work. And on, In fact, we even argue that there should be a good work standard, which employers should sign up to, and there might even be a tax break for companies that uh, met it. Or, and certainly we argue that companies that don't meet a good work standard should not be able to be eligible for public procurement. So we, there's a big focus on good work in that. And we define it too. So, and if you look at the Scottish Government, they've been doing some trying to define this, what they call their Fair Work Convention. So I think the notion of good work is actually where we've got. So rubbish job, we, never, we don't talk about that at all. That was a kind of off-the-cuff remark. The notion of good work, I think, is really important. Um, uh, uh, and that we are very, uh, we think is very important. And interestingly, we think good work is liable to, as most of the evidence shows, to raise productivity. Because people who are better motivated doing work that, uh, that meets their own skill levels, we have an extraordinary uh, underutilization of the skills of the workforce. A third of people are working below the skill level that they have in the British economy. But there are also places, Michael, I'm so, sure yeah. you would agree, where that isn't necessarily true. So actually mining, interestingly, is one of those places where it is possible to raise productivity relatively easily through technological innovation. Um, in some places in the economy, some places that we might want to value quite highly, like health and education and social care and renovation and refurbishment, intensely labour-intensive uh, labor places of the economy where it's harder to push that uh, role of labour productivity growth. That, that is, uh, to some extent, potentially a challenge to that idea that if you pay people more, you'll, you'll raise their productivity measured as output per hour worked. Yes, I think that's true, and, and we need many more jobs in, in, those, in those sectors. Um, but, you know, AI, AI is coming into, into healthcare, and it's doing, it's doing a better job than some humans. So diagnostic testing, AI, unsurprisingly, because this is about the computational, this is about uh, computation, is, is, uh, is proving very good at certain forms of diagnosis. That's a good thing. That will free other people to do, all the, to do caring roles and other things. I have no... Uh, there will be more people employed in health, despite lots and lots of new technologies... Um, in healthcare. In practice, in the public sector, the productivity equation barely matters. It's almost impossible to measure productivity in health because the number of because of the quality of the work. And so quality is a major problem in measurement of productivity in general. Statisticians really have problems. It's particularly problematic in healthcare. So to be perfectly honest, productivity in the health in the healthcare system is not our primary concern. What's our concern is are we treating people better and are more people living for longer uh, and not using the health service in the first place and so on. Um, there's a whole different agenda which I don't think is very much to do with productivity. Miata, we haven't perhaps 
best understood the challenges facing those communities who actually will find themselves and have already found themselves out of work. Is that a part of this answer to the question about trust, that actually political leadership has lost trust specifically from misunderstanding the challenges of those kinds of communities? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so I think it's, I think it's twofold. Um, I think, um, and particularly, I think when we're thinking about things like the green transition, um, you know, the idea that you would eliminate uh, fossil fuels will have a detrimental impact to some communities. So we absolutely must have a response. Um, and thinking about how you change the nature of those economies to create different types of jobs, I think, has to be part of the answer. But for me, I think your point about trust is absolutely key. Um, and if you want to sort of try to prosecute this kind of agenda and take this agenda forward, we've got to rebuild trust. Um, for me, the way that we do that is to try to reignite uh, and empower people on the ground. So this is why we say the way you do this is just as important. We can't, we're past the world where you can have top-down ideas that some smart people in Whitehall come up with and you dictate and it happens across the... It just won't work. We've passed that. So you've got to flip it around. You've got to start with people, energise them, engage them. Um, and actually, the thing that we find really interesting, so we go to communities and we take an issue and, we get, and people come around it and they'll come around it with their MPs, they'll come around it with their local politicians to try to come up with a response. And in doing that, the trust you create, the kind of cooperation you create, I think is absolutely key. So... The piece around renewing our politics and our democracy, which I think sits underneath all of this, I think we achieve through decentralising. I think we achieve through starting with people giving them agency and power to make decisions, but also understanding the decisions that enable them to do things. Um, and the fact that it is an endeavour between communities um, and the state, the local state, critical and empowering and beefing up the local state as well as the national state, I think is part of the answer. And I think unless we start from there, our ability to do any of this, um, I think will be hugely muted just because the old model kind of doesn't work. Uh, we've tried to grapple with so many of these issues for so long and doing it by yanking the lever at the top and hoping it kind of delivers the outcomes on the ground just hasn't worked. It hasn't worked for years and years. So we must, must conceive, design and implement policy that starts with our people and starts with trying to empower those people. And through that process, I think that's how we re reinvigorate our democracy and our politics. Michael. I think this is such an important question and it's, it's a kind of catch-22, isn't it? Because... Um, we need governments to implement much of this agenda, including the things that they do do centrally. If we want to re-regulate the financial system, that's got to be the central state which does it. Uh, if we want to um, have workers on boards and different corporate structures, I can't. it's not going to happen through voluntary, uh, through voluntary action. That's going to happen through law. If we're going to reform the labour market, that's going to happen through law. But you're not going to be able to give governments... Governments are not going to be able to do that unless they have the legitimacy of public support. And while people distrust governments and politicians so much, they're not going to be able to do it. The way to get that trust is to deliver. Most politicians kind of know that. No politician is liked. I mean, a few are. But, but, but really, politicians don't expect to be liked. They expect to be rewarded when they deliver. And by delivering, it means affecting the people, lives people have. So government... Um, so this is where the catch-22 is, because you can't do that until you're in government, until you've got the believers of power to do that. But until you do it, people won't trust. And we know what happens when people don't trust politicians. They vote for the anti-politicians. And we've now got a generation of anti-politicians have emerged in... Uh, and what I mean by anti-politicians are people who spout the language of politics but are prim not about solving people's problems. They're about um, uh, b uh, building a sense of identity which supports them as uh, uh, in their voting, but don't proceed to address the problems. Trump is an example. Uh, the Italian government is another example. God forbid what will happen in Brazil on Sunday. Um, and these are politicians who are, who, re who are a response to the loss of trust that the public have got in conventional politicians. We have got to find ways of electing those politicians and then of them delivering. Because once politicians deliver and people see the improvements, then they, the trust will build up. There isn't a way of doing trust kind of... There isn't a trust agenda... There isn't a set of policies you can do about trust. Trust comes from people believing you will make a difference. And unfortunately, to do that, you've got to be elected, which is why this is a, a difficult catch-22. I'm going to take a couple more questions very, very quickly. I'm going to park the net energy cliff question, which I'm, I think is a fundamental challenge, but I want you to put it in the Sustainable okay. Economy Act. Yeah. Um, and you could okay. come and talk about it. It should definitely be the yeah. foundation of that act, it seems to me. 
Hi. Um, I come from more of a design retail background, and I'm not really an expert in sustainability. I'm just interested in it. But um, I find it really interesting thinking about the impact that David Attenborough has had as an individual. He's not um, a representative of any political party. And along with the BBC, the Blue Planet um, documentary, like the impact that that's had. And I wonder if actually rather than just talking about the politics or grassroots that like who in this room is media and who works in marketing, um, like getting that message out there, like I'm sure this isn't on Instagram, but it should be. You know, all of those sorts of things. And what strategy is for, for that? Yeah. Thank you. Pretty sure it is on Instagram and Twitter um, because our own communications and marketing people are very, very good at that. But it's a good challenge. How did we take that message out there? Uh, yes, David. All right. So I work at the, or partly work at the UCL Institute for uh, Global Prosperity, a sort of sister institute. And one of the visiting professors there uh, lived for six months in Barking and Dagenham and also in, I think it's called Jonesville, which is a former steel town in Ohio. And he found there that people, um, they were feeling left behind economically, but also left out culturally and being done to rather than being on, having any agency and in particular external forces changing things without their consent. And he found that people would often say, I don't, I'm not racist, but... And then the thing they would say afterwards was sometimes racist, but sometimes wasn't. And so the thing I want to bring into our conversation is identity and immigration and how if you're Matthew Goodwin and doing his polling, he says what the centre-left get wrong about all of this justice stuff is they only focus on the economics and they don't focus on the identity and the immigration. And isn't it more likely that as we require state responses to the challenges we face, when we mix that with where people are at with identity right now, aren't we more likely to end up with a 1920s Italian response of corporatism rather than the sorts of things which are described in your reports. Okay, communication, identity, and the third question there. Hi, um, I work for a sustainability consultancy and we work a lot around about planetary boundaries, but also with social thresholds and with regards to the Sustainable Economy Act, would social thresholds have any play, part to play in, in that act? And also, what would the act have in terms of big business? Would it impose legislation with big business? Do you want to take that one first, Michael? Um, so, uh, um, I'm not going to go into a complete exposition of the Sustainable Economy Act. There's some more material in the, in the book, um, uh, and I've written a bit about it um, elsewhere. There's a blog on the Green Alliance website at the moment, for example. Um, would it address big business? Uh, not directly. Um, it'll be, it would be focused, as the Climate Change Act is, on the outcomes that you're seeking to achieve or to make sure that you don't uh, achieve. And then it would, so it, would set, it would require government to set a series of planetary boundary-based sustainable limits, um, and it would then require government to produce policies and plans to keep the economy within those limits. That's the basic structure of the Climate Change Act. There would also be an independent committee which would then which would advise on what those limits should be and whether the government was, was doing them. That's basically the structure of the Climate Change Act, and my, our view was that we should repeat this for the rest of the environmental impacts which the economy um, has. So, yes, businesses would be affected by it because under those policies and plans, um, businesses would, would uh, be required to meet those sustainable limits in various kind of ways, but it wouldn't primarily be uh, framed in terms of those. Um, we hadn't got the idea of social thresholds in. I think social thresholds, is, I'd be interested to dis kind of discuss with you, what you where you think social thresholds uh, lie. Um, Part of the reason and the way the Climate Change Act was worked, but the Sustainable Economy Act work, would be on the basis of, of natural sciences and of our understanding of what uh, sustainable limits are. Although, of course, they are deeply embedded in social choices. The environment rarely, rarely has um, uh, precise thresholds. They're mo mostly socially and politically chosen, so that's an important part of the process. But that's an interesting question, and one of the criteria that you would have to take into account are the uh, social and distributional impacts, as the Climate Change Act requires as well in terms of carbon budgets. Um, on the net energy, this is a really interesting question, and uh, it's a very good question, which is um, uh, how far our, uh, we are limited by energy. Uh, of course, the planet has unlimited uh, energy. That is how we counter entropy, the natural entropic force um, uh, of uh, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which uh, governs the economy, um, is countered by 
the solar energy that the sun provides. Um, and the remarkable thing about climate change is it is, uh, uh, it is concerned primarily with an energy system um, that we could deal without, we could pr produce enough energy for the world without fossil fuels at all, without any carbon. We have chosen through industrialization because carbon was a concentrated form of fuel and we knew how to mine the concentrated form of, uh, uh, of, uh, of energy. That was the easiest way for us to do it industrially. Of course, pre-existing societies, pre-industrial, had used the sun and used water and other things. Um, we've now got to go back to the renewable sources. So I'm not, uh, um, technologically, that is unquestionably feasible to power the entire global economy without fossil fuels. It is going to be very difficult to do it. We have to do it unbelievably quickly. That is going to be very, very, very difficult. And Clive was right, gave us the, the figures this morning on, from the new IPCC report. But in principle, that is much, much more soluble than the land question. The competition for land, for growing enough food at the same time as we grow the materials, particularly those that will substitute for fossil fuel-based materials, and that people can live on and so on, that is a much more finite resource. Uh, and so on. So that's a much bigger challenge. And then the water that goes with it, with the land. So in, in my view, actually, you know, climate change is definitely the most urgent of the questions because we are being destroyed by climate change. But curiously, it's not the most technologically or physically difficult of the problems we, we face. And, and as we shift towards re re renewable forms, those, those, those big, that, that equation gets yes. tougher. It gets tougher, it, absolutely, uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so, uh, so we, you know, that that is the the net energy question is a is a really crucial one. There's no question. And as long as we're producing lots of cement through fossil fuels, we are going to use up an enormous amount of the carbon budget simply through the amount of infrastructure that we're we're laying down. There's no question about that. But that is that it doesn't o overcome the core problem that we have to decarbonize as quickly as possible. And as we do so, then more and more of the energy is, is, comes from the renewable resources that are going into the production of, uh, uh, of, of the energy. Did you want me to answer any of the, the others? Yes. Uh, oh, I identity. To, Can I come yeah, to identity? Identity is really I'll important. Ask, Ra racist politicians of the right are exploiting one kind of identity that people can feel, which is an ethnically based um, uh, and, and historically based identity. But people feel many identities, and there are plenty of examples of communities organising around their communities and community-creating identity where ethnicity is not a factor, where people have come together in multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-heritage communities and feel identity around those things. And, the example, and we all know examples of community organisations which are non-ethnically based where people have identity. People feel British in a non-ethnic way. Many, many, many people. We must not leave the, identity, the idea of identity politics as something that belongs to the right and to a racist form of it. There is a racist form of identity politics and it is being exploited by racist politicians. But there are plenty of forms of identity politics which build on our sense of our, lo of our locality, of our nation, of our Europe in which identity is an important part of it, but ethnicity has nothing to do with it. And I am unwilling to concede identity politics to, to, uh, to the right or to an ethnically-based form of it. And the same people who are, who are being led to believe that their main identity is an ethnic one are also capable of, being, of feeling their identity based around the community that they live in, their values, uh, and other things. People are not simply one thing or another. And we have to bring out of people, as Kerry Kennedy said this morning, the better angels of their natures and find ways of appealing to identity that doesn't divide us but um, uh, is based on what we have in common. Yeah, so yeah. I, look, I agree with that. And I think there are probably two issues to unpick. I think there's a question of immigration, um, which, if you like, in some respects, you know, was one of the big drivers um, for Brexit. And for me... You know, what's the reality? I think in some communities, immigration is generally a problem. Um, and people feel that, you know, people have come in, they've suppressed their wages, uh, they've taken their homes, they've made, created pressures on schools, on... 
and they're sort of right um, because they have because immigration isn't um, fairly distributed across the country and I think there's been a huge failure of policy so when we know that certain communities are going to feel the impacts of immigration more than other communities we needed policies that were going to mitigate that we needed more investment in public services in those areas we needed more houses built in those areas and we needed effective legislation to stop the suppression of wages and we didn't have that so their gripe is a legitimate gripe because there has been a failure of policy and for me it was a failure of policy it wasn't the fault of the immigrants so I think that's the first thing to say and I think the d debate about immigration I think it's either people dismiss it it's not a thing it's racist um, which I, I think kind of plays to some of the worst um, instincts on the far right I'd say not the right the far right um, or uh, you know they exploit it and in the end, I think there's just an honest debate with people that says, yeah, actually, in some of your community, in other communities, it's just perception. It's, oh, over there, they've got an immigration problem. We don't have it, but we think it's a problem across the country because it's happening in London. Um, and actually, London's like, it's fine. Um, so there's a, part, a, per, a perception problem, but there are parts of the country where it's a legitimate problem. And we've got to realise and also have the honest conversation. It's not the fault of the immigrants. It's the fault of your government uh, at both local and national levels. So I think that's the first thing I'd say. Um, I think on identity politics, I completely agree with Michael. And the thing that we find quite heartening is that, you know, we will go into communities that are quite divided, not just in terms of ethnicity, uh, but in terms of class or in terms of, you know, which part of the kind of community that artificial boundary you come from. And people will coalesce around an issue that they can work together and it breaks down that sense of us and them and it creates a sense of community and actually the strongest form of identity is the thing that people feel in quite localized communities and for me there is a power in that um, that I think is an antidote to the kind of very negative type of um, identity politics that I think we should exploit. Um, and on the point of the media, you are absolutely right. Um, you know, think tanks, the thing that we care about um, is trying to get as much media coverage, as much social media coverage. I think we're behind the curve on a lot of this. Um, and there are lots of very worthy debates that are happening um, amongst a small group of people who are kind of like-minded, uh, kind of all think the same, uh, quite city-centric, quite London-centric. And there is a big challenge for us about how we reach out there um, and, you know, the Blue Planet was absolutely phenomenal because it just increased the consciousness about an issue that most people, you know, there was a cohort of people that were talking about it for a very long time and most people had no idea. So our capacity to talk beyond our usual suspects, our capacity to talk beyond our bubble, for me, and investments in Whitehall, I think it's absolutely critical. And thinking cleverly about how we use different types of media outlet is something we absolutely have to do. And that's something we think, you know, as NEF, as a think tank, we're behind the curve on, but we need to move pretty quickly. Thank you both very much. It is um, very much part of what CUSP is trying to do to engage in that communication task. And, and we have, um, in pursuit of that, we even have a theme of our work, which is around the arts and communication. And as I mentioned uh, as Kate mentioned at, at lunchtime, um, we have a, an exhibition downstairs, so if you haven't had a chance to look at that, do have a look at that um, <coughs> later on. Let me ask you first of all, though, there was a fantastic, far-ranging, um, sometimes challenging conversation, but, but a, a real tribute to um, our speakers in this session. I'd like to ask you to thank Michael Jacobson and Miata Fandola. <laughs> So before I, you, you go to that, that legendary place of looking at the exhibition and, and getting some refreshments, I'd, I'd like to, us to spend a little bit more time um, in reflection with um, Rowan Williams. Um, Rowan has been our, our patron and our, our support in this um, entire Nature of Prosperity dialogue, and he brings to it uh, the richness of the theologian, the eloquence of the poet and the far sight of the visionary. And so it's a huge pleasure to ask uh, Rowan to give us a few reflections on the day um, at this point. Thank you. I'd like to ask you to welcome Rowan to the stage. Thank you. After a day like this, I'm not quite sure whether I should be panicking more about the fact that people have said all that's worth saying or about the fact that there are enormous questions that haven't been addressed and have been left to be picked up at the end of the day. <laughs> Whatever happens, uh, bear with me. 
But let me say, first of all, in reaction to one particular comment, an important one that came up in the last discussion session, I have an increasing sense at the moment that most of our conventional characterizations of left and right in global politics aren't really working very well any longer. There's generally, I think, a realignment in politics waiting to happen. And some of what we assume to be given left and right identities are not quite where they were. I found it very interesting and very encouraging, in a way, that the response to the report, which we've been discussing, did come from unexpected parts of the political spectrum. And I think that's something we ought to be giving some long thought to, if we care as we do, about the future of democracy. But that's just a, a general comment, which I think is bound to be weaving in and out of some of what we've been listening to. But I wanted to begin a more um, detailed reflection on the day with a question that came up in this morning's discussion session, which was really essentially about what's happened since 1968. Well, in 1968, I, I went up to uh, university as a student, and I'm deeply alarmed to think it's 50 years since I did that. But it's true to say, I think, not only because of Robert Kennedy, but because of many other figures at the time, there was a fairly widespread sense that the political climate should and could change, that there was political leadership around that was trustworthy and inspiring, that there was a growing recognition of manifest structural injustices which could be tackled. And certainly quite a lot of that has been lost in the intervening half century. And I was thinking about the, the details of that loss and how, how it happened. And I suppose we do have to tell a story of how that happened simply in order to help ourselves think through where we are now. Those of us who were involved, well, what is it now, 18 years or so ago in the Jubilee 2000 campaign, will remember the narrative that was around then. Jubilee 2000 was about cancelling the unpayable debt of disadvantaged countries. And the narrative that supported that campaign, that moderately successful campaign, was something like this that during the 1970s, one of the factors that sent the global economy into a continuing spin was the bulge of oil revenues, the need to shift lots of unexpected money around the world to find new markets for money, in effect. That's continued to spiral since then with the effect that a great deal of our attention has been drawn away from what's been called the real economy towards the world of financial services. And as that in turn has developed, there's been a deep impulse to develop more and more sophisticated and speculative instruments for financial services. These in turn generate a pattern of indebtedness the international indebtedness of the 70s, but increasingly, of course, the personal levels of indebtedness that most developed societies are now trapped in. Add to that what we've been discussing a bit this afternoon, the effect and the growth of automation, the decline in manufacturing industries in many developed countries, the search, well, the race to the bottom in terms of where you can locate cheap labour and what you have is, I think, precisely what we've got at the moment, a globalised economy heavily dependent on systemic debt. Now, I begin by thinking about that history and about that gradual foregrounding of debt as a reality of all our lives, because, of course, thinking about debt has everything to do with thinking about power. Indebtedness locates power somewhere else. And, again, a theme that's kept coming back today is how we restore agency to individuals and communities. Indebtedness is one of the things that limits 
and you could say erodes agency. And because debt is of its very nature backward looking, debt is something which makes it harder to take initiatives, to take risks, and therefore to have the kind of agency that changes an entire environment. And I would hope that in our thinking in CUSP around the meaning of prosperity, we keep coming back to this question of if you like, the ethical and human context of debt as a pervasive reality. Power and agency, as I say, have been around quite a bit in today's discussion, very importantly. And I heard and resonated with what was said this afternoon, especially by Miata, about redistribution in itself not being quite the answer. To use the jargon, we needed at least what we might call sustainable redistribution. That's to say it's not just enough to look at where tax revenue comes from and throw it somewhere else. You need to have a self-sustaining, a self-perpetuating pattern of economic well-being, where, as I say, agency, levels of control, levels of initiative are given to the people who are actually doing the work, which is why I also um, resonate very deeply with what was said about the need to increase stakeholder, the stakeholder base in all this. And Mike had things to say about that, which I would very much like to pursue at greater length, but I'll spare you that. But sustainable re redistribution could be put in another way, and I'm thinking here of a very interesting talk I heard just about four weeks ago at a symposium on sustainable prosperity organized by the Learned Society of Wales, the Welsh equivalent of the British Academy, where one speaker said that the challenge was to move from, in thinking about justice or fairness, the challenge was to move from distribution to contribution, from distribution to contribution. That's to say, if we, if we are trapped by certain models of redistribution, the effect will be to leave the agency with whatever power is doing the redistributing and not to focus on what can actually be put into the conversation and the corporate work of an economy by people whose initiative is released. So not just, said this speaker, distributive justice, but contributive justice. How are people liberated to enter into that process of collaboration and negotiation? I take the point that's been raised in discussion, especially this afternoon, about the complexities around automation and artificial intelligence. And I welcome the perspective that says we mustn't be too apocalyptic about this. Nonetheless, there are challenges here which I think will have a heavy and difficult impact for us if we don't do what Miata was saying just now, think forward about how we meet them, think how we prepare people to encounter new possibilities. In other words, how people are to understand their agency, their contribution, and what it's for. Yes, as workers, as people able to do good work, but also as people able to do that particular form of good work, which is making communities work well. I was delighted this morning to hear reference to community organizing as part of this. And when we think about that contributory society and economy, when we think about how we nurture people towards that agency which expresses itself not only in the work you do in order to make a living, but the work you do in order to make life worth living in a community, how do we think about all that? That, I think, really impacts on the fundamental question which CUSP addresses of well-being. Lots has been said today about GDP. 
and about that very significant speech made 50 years ago by Robert Kennedy about GDP. That we unthinkingly operate a measure of prosperity which simply ignores developments in health or literacy or job satisfaction or whatever else. How we persuade ourselves to live with that myth, I don't quite know. And yet we do, and this keeps coming back. And the disjunction, as was pointed out this afternoon, the disjunction between what GDP figures will tell us in this or any country and what the actual experience is on the street is one of the most worrying aspects of the world we're in. Brazil was mentioned a little while ago. I happened to be in Sao Paulo three weeks ago with some of the Christian aid projects working there and in the Amazon region. And Brazil, which is about, I think, to experience one of the worst political disasters of the continent for a long time, Brazil was, is, has been for a long time, a cardinal case of disjunction between what the figures say and what the experience is of poverty or privation. But that's perhaps another story, but one that I hope we don't forget. So, thus far, I've been trying to draw out how those two themes of debt and the political and social agency that debt undermines, how those themes are tightly woven in to whatever we might want to say about sustainable patterns of prosperity. But I want to add just one or two more reflections of a slightly more general character. Again, one of the subjects that's occupied us today has been, to use a word that hasn't been much used but whose substance has been around, security. We all know, sadly, what, what we think we mean by security, and it's usually somebody else trying to secure themselves against us as citizens, as foreigners, as travellers, as whatever. But, of course, security is what we have been talking about today. What is it that makes us feel fundamentally safe? And not only fundamentally safe now and for ourselves, but what is it that gives us a sense of a security we can guarantee for the next generation? And in trying to get across the certainly challenging and revolutionary notions that have been circulated, circulating today to a nervous and reluctant political establishment, let alone a nervous and reluctant country, the notion that we are interested in and invested in the safety of our children and the next generation seems to me one of the most instinctively obvious places to start. Do we actually want the next generation to enjoy a measure of hmm, a sense of a guarantee of certain basic fairnesses, certain basic provisions and redresses. I think most people do. And the story that I've outlined about the last 50 years, a story we're all very familiar with, the story of this particular phase in the history of global econ economics and world capitalism, that's a story which has had the effect against its own instincts and propaganda of seriously undermining the sense of security for huge swathes of populations. We have an economic system which does not reinforce that kind of security. And if part of what that produces is the more obvious threats to security that we talk about in terms of terrorism and various other sorts of aggression, well, that's not entirely surprising. But we can at least say that one of the fruits of the last 50 years has been insecurity, spiralling insecurity. And that may be where we need, again, in the discussions that this centre fosters and encourages, we need to think about how we're going to define security.
if the effects of the last 50 years are, as I and others have outlined, generators of insecurity, we need, I suspect, to think through very carefully what it means to live in a world where I am only secure if you are secure, where the human race is only secure if the natural environment is secure, where the developed world is only secure if the developing world is secure, where the Western world is only secure if the non-Western world is secure, where Israel is only secure if Palestine is secure, and so on and so on. And for me, that is absolutely at the moral and spiritual centre of what we are concerned about. Do we believe in that mutually assured security? Bizarrely, we got used for a long time to thinking that our military security depended on something called mutually assured destruction, which is just a tad paradoxical if you think it through. <clears throat> well, what about trying to foreground that priority of a mutually assured security in our world and in our society. Because it's precisely that which is so profoundly undermined, even dissolved, by spiraling inequality. We talked this afternoon about trust and the erosion of trust. And a system which drives ever-deepening inequalities is not a system which generates trust certainly not one which gives any evidence of the mutual assurance of security. So one of our jobs is, I think, redefining, constantly reimagining what we mean by that word security. Just as, as I've already hinted, we need to go on redefining justice as something which is essentially to do with giving voice, allowing contribution nurturing agency. We've touched on questions of communication and education, and very importantly this afternoon, also questions of culture. And I don't want us to let those slip at this point. What builds trust, what builds the reality of mutual assurance is a complex, I think, of what was earlier described as empathetic understanding, shared culture, a sense sometimes of shared challenge as well as shared conviction. And in the world as it is at the moment, where, as has been said so often, all the major crises are not just national ones. The sense of shared challenge is potentially part of how we develop a sense of a shared narrative and how we grow in some sort of empathic understanding with others, particularly those who are more on the front line of environmental disaster than we are so far in this country. So there's a certain urgency about addressing how we build that common culture. And that leads me to my last main point, which is something that's been, I have to say, pressing on me more and more in the last year or so. Sustainable prosperity, yes. And that means we need sustainable institutions, and I'm using institution in the widest possible sense. A sustainable institution is a form of public life, which may be, in the more narrow sense, cultural, which may be educational, legal, religious, whatever, a form of public shared life, which has more resilience than simply what goes according to the electoral cycle which has the capacity to think longer thoughts, to have a perspective which embraces what's likely to happen within 10, 20, or 50 years, and which has some sort of lasting credibility and trustworthiness. One of the things that worries me in many of our 
political cultures at the moment is the erosion of sustainable institutions, attacks on the judiciary, the functionalizing and trivializing of education. We see, interestingly and alarmingly in the United States, a really rather concerted attack on institutions by the executive. We're seeing bits of it here, though not nearly as worryingly yet. Though I think um, a headline which describes the judges of this country as enemies of the people should give us a little bit of pause here. But that's what I mean by the undermining of institutions. I'm not, um, I hope I needn't underline this, I'm not saying all the institutions of the British establishment are wonderful and ought to be regarded uncritically. I'm saying that a healthy society has long-term reliable institutions that are not just about party politics and not just about electoral cycles, so as to keep on the public radar the awareness of those problems which are going to need cooperative and patient solution, and which also give people a sense of shared identity and shared enterprise, that is the enterprise of solving social problems, over and above narrower political identities. Which is why the question of left and right is an important one, and I don't want to make light of it. But in a context such as the present one in this country, where for all practical purposes we don't have a government because we have a ruling group wholly preoccupied with squaring a circle, it's rather difficult to know how one begins to address this question of building or strengthening the sustainable institution. But I hope, moving to conclusion, I'd hope that the sort of discussion we've been having today will help us fill that out a little bit. Because it's true, as has been noted in discussion, that one of the things that's happened during this particular session has been a far stronger, and I think in some ways far riskier, framing of some of the questions about sustainable prosperity within a political context, broadly speaking. I hope not partisan in a narrow way, but definitely raising those issues about politics, therefore about power, therefore about who controls the narrative and so on, raising those questions with a recognition that you can't really discuss prosperity without discussing that whole set of things in national and global politics that makes it possible or impossible. And I think that's probably good for us. But it's important to notice that that's one of the things that's been happening today. And because those broader questions of politics have been raised, then I think we are, once again, as often in our discussions in CUSP, brought back to the very basic question of what exactly we think human beings are for and what they're like and what we say about them independently of their productivity and all the rest of it. The question again about work which was raised and the question of how we reward work and whether that depends on productivity, I think that raised very, very precisely and in a focused way the question of the worth we give to certain kinds of work, certain kinds of activity, and ultimately, of course, to ourselves and to one another as human beings. And I hope that at least one of the things we can take away from today is an enhanced sense of the worth of the human enterprise, the worth of the perspectives that have been shared here today, the worth, above all, of those contributions that need to be enabled, galvanized, and enriched by a genuinely prosperous society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan, <coughs> for those um, wonderful reflections on the day. I think rather than take questions, because we've gone a little bit later, I'll, I'll leave them to stand, because there are so many things there, really, that, that are worth reflecting on. I was particularly struck by 
by, by your framing, um, Rowan, in terms of security and the sense in which we, we strive for that security and the, the sense in which also that security goes missing if uh, the security of others is not taken into account. I think that's a, um, a potentially very rich theme for a, a future conversation um, within the dialogue. Um, this one has now more or less come to an end. Our revels now are ended. Um, as the aptly named Prospero once said in um, The Tempest. Um, and it's my job really to thank all those who were engaged in bringing the revels together. Um, and as you'll all know, that doesn't happen without an awful lot of work. So my huge thanks in particular to Catherine, Linda, Nula and Gemma, who have done the bulk of the hard lifting, the heavy lifting in making today possible. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of those who were helping in the wings, um, often invisible, sometimes visible with microphones. So Amy, Anastasia, Angela, Ian, Simon, Sue and Ben in particular, and any one of the team <coughs> who I may have missed in the process. Um, a particular thanks to our speakers. It's been a, an extraordinarily uh, rich set of interventions from um, some wonderful, eloquent speakers. So my thanks in particular to uh, Kerry Kennedy, to Clive Lewis, to Miata Fambule, to Michael Jacobs, and to Rowan Williams. <laughs> As Kate mentioned, and as I reiterated before, do please take a little bit of time to um, look at the exhibition that we have downstairs. Do please give us a little bit of feedback from your thoughts from the event. Um, it's a particular pleasure to begin to attract so many of you back to these discussions um, to talk about the issues that come up. And as Rowan said, I think this was a particularly challenging uh, set of issues that we've looked at here today but one that is core to the way that we are thinking in CUSP and indeed to all of the discussions that are happening around uh, prosperity and around justice and the discussions that give us the basis for the ripples of hope that, um, that uh, Kerry was talking about this morning. That wouldn't happen uh, without your involvement in it and it's a fantastic pleasure to have so many of you with us here today. I want, you to, I want to thank you for that and to invite you now to partake of some light refreshment, refreshments um, in the hall below. Thank you all very much for coming.